Good morning, Oasis. We welcome you, but most of all, we welcome the Holy Spirit. If you're in the lobby, if you're watching online, we welcome you in. But again, we welcome Holy Spirit. Fear, you got to go in Jesus' name. Rejection, you got to go in Jesus' name. Anxiety and depression, you got to go in Jesus' name. The only spirit that is welcome here is the Holy Spirit. We say, King Jesus, come, have your way. Inhabit the praises of your people today. Have your way. We pull on your glory. We pull on the anointing today. We say, come, come. Mess us up today again. Yesterday's manna is not sufficient. It's stale, it's old, and it's moldy. We don't want yesterday's religion. We want today's fire. So the fire of God consume me. Consume me. Let nothing left but your spirit in me. Holy Spirit, from the core of my inner being, from my bones, from my blood and my DNA. Rewrite our DNA, Father, that we have the DNA of Jesus Christ. You have the mind of Christ, and we say anxiety, you have to go. Suicidal thoughts, you have no place in the kingdom. You must go in Jesus' name. Tormenting spirits, you have no place in this house. We clear the airwaves today. We take control of the Holy Spirit control tower and we say this is a closed airspace only open for the Holy Spirit to fall. No bombs from the enemy are allowed in here. No thought bombs are allowed. Only the Holy Spirit, only the love of Abba Father. We say come Jesus, come, come, come. Come Lord Jesus, come. Oh, we welcome you with praise. Oh, you inhabit the praises of your people. Oh, we say welcome Jesus. We say welcome Jesus. Your praise is always on our lips. We lift high your name. Oh, the heavens are your throne and the earth is your footstool. Great and mighty are your works. Great and mighty are your exploits. Oh, you come in demonstration and power. Oh, you come to prove your love for us. Oh, you never leave us. Your name is faithful and true and righteous. Your name is faithful and true. You are not a man that you should lie. Your promises are yes and amen. Oh, we stir up that good faith within us. We trust you. We know that our Father is good. We have a good, good Father. And we say, come, come Jesus. Oh, we are hungry today. We are thirsty today. We are in need today. Oh, if you don't come, Jesus, if you don't come, it's all for nothing, God. Everything apart from you. Let there be a desperation in this room. Let there be a hunger in this room. Oh, stir it up. Stir it up. Oh, where would we be without our God? Where would we be without our Father? Where would we lie without Him? We would be in ruins. We would be in ruins. But because you loved us first, God, because you saw us first, because your love for us, God, hey, Oh God, we cry out to you today. We cry out to you today, God. You are the only one worthy. We thank 
thank you for your presence in this place today. We thank you that you are living within us. God, that we would reach deep down inside ourselves and know who you are, God, and express our love for you and give our all to you, Lord God, because you are worthy. We take nothing. We take nothing for granted today, God.
pushing back darkness today. Oh, we're pushing it back. Oh, your light, your light dispels all darkness and darkness will not overcome it. So we're pushing it back. We're pushing it back. Push, push. Oh, hey, there's a plundering in the spirit right now. There's a plundering in the spirit right now. We're going to the enemy's camp and we're taking it back. We're taking it back. We're taking it back. Oh, you're on notice. Unloose, unlock what you thought you had bound, what you thought you had kept. Oh, we're taking it back. And you gotta pay. That's right, you gotta pay. Seven times what you took. We're taking it back in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm telling you, push, push. Oh, kingdom of light, kingdom of light. It's for this purpose that the sun was manifested to dispel and eradicate and rip up all the works of the devil. All the works, all the works. So I say, push, push. Oh, darkness you flee at the mention of the name of Jesus, at the mention of your name. Not by any other name does darkness flee, does strongholds break, break. Oh, you break the heavy yoke. You break the heavy yoke. Oh, hey, hey, Jesus. Come on, people of God, rise up. The word says that Jesus pushed back and he saw the joy set before him. That's how he was able to go to the cross. There is a joy that is set before you if you will step into the pushback back praise today. So I command the soldiers of the army of God to arise. Sons and daughters, rise up. He says, come child, I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come and take upon me what you want. We say, Holy Spirit, have this service, have your way. Come in and consume us, consuming fire, blow in, blow in, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, spirit of perversion, you gotta go. Spirit of anxiety, you gotta go. Depression, you gotta go. In Jesus' name, love of the Father come. Love of the Father overwhelm. Overwhelming, oh the overwhelming, reckless love of God. Let us be abandoned in our praise today. Let us be consumed with your love so we don't care about who's next to us. All we care about is the light of the sun coming in and shining forth his glory in and through us today. We say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Abba, Abba, Abba. Father, we love you. We give you the spirit. We give you the service. In Jesus' name. Enter in with praise. We enter in with praise. 
get stolen today. Come on, church. We're taking back what the enemy has stolen. And we give him praise. Come on. We're taking back what the enemy has stolen. Come on, prophesy. We enter in the gates with praise. We enter in the gates with praise. We enter in the gates with praise. And taking back what the enemy has stolen. We enter in the gates with praise. We enter in the gates with praise. We enter in the gates with praise. They're taking back what the enemy has stolen. We're entering the gates with praise. We're entering the gates with praise. We're entering the gates with praise. We're taking back. Come on. 
on, come on and bless him. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and bless him. Oh, bless him. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and bless him. Oh, praise him. And bless him. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and bless him. Oh, we're breaking ground. Jesus is lifted high. Jesus is lifted high. Jesus is lifted high. Jesus is lifted high. 
you to Jesus. Oh, just say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're the only one. You're your glory come down you're only one you're only one you're only one so let your glory come down 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 Let your glory come down. Let your glory come down. Let your glory come down. Thank you, Lord.
can hear the sound of the king coming down. And we gotta bow low, let our crowns hit the ground. I can hear the sound of the king coming down. And we gotta bow low, let our crowns hit the ground. Hit the ground. Let our crown 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 hit the ground. just want to release the word of God over us in this moment. And then we're going to go back into singing this line and whatever God wants to do, we'll just go from there. But as we were worshiping, this is the verse that the Lord put on my heart. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 18. I'm going to read this slow so that you can let this sink in. Let it sink into your soul and the depths of who you are. Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you are wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. As the scriptures say, He traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. And again, the scriptures also say, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise and he knows they are worthless. Sometimes in these moments, we can get caught in the trap of human reasoning. Whoa, what is happening? Whoa, this is odd. Whoa, I've never experienced an atmosphere like this before. And I just want to encourage you to lean in to the spirit and die to that old man and that old human reasoning that would talk you out of missing out on the goodness of God and the freedom of God, the peace of God, the joy of God. It's going to probably come differently than your human reasoning thinks it should come. Now, this is the verse that just bubbled up in me as we were worshiping. So don't boast about following a particular human leader. For everything belongs to you. This is what I heard in my spirit. Remind the people today, everything belongs to you. Don't boast in just one particular thing because the crazy thing is, as good of a thing as that thing may be, there's so much more. Are you catching this? Don't boast in your crown because that's just limiting you. There's so much more. Don't boast in your leader. That's limiting you. There's so much more. He says, don't boast about following a particular human leader for everything belongs to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life and death or the present and the future, Everything belongs to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. I just want you to raise your hands as high and big and wide as you possibly can and say, Abba, I'm open. Everything you have belongs to me. Help me to receive. Oh, Abba, right now I just release your word over this house. Everything that has been made available to us, inheritance through us, through the blood of the Lamb, through the work of the cross, today we receive everything that belongs to us. We lay down our life. We lay down our crowns. The little that we have to offer, we lay it down for the great exchange to receive everything, 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 everything that is available. We receive your healing today. We receive your miracle. 
down. He says, daughter, son, it's all available. It's all available. It's all available. As we sing this line, I can hear the sound. in your heart, just open up and receive whatever it looks like, whatever it sounds down. like, whatever he has for you. I can hear the sound. Because the, the truth is, when the spirit and the bride say come, I can hear the sound. we have the opportunity to drink freely from the living waters of Jesus. That means we get to drink as much as we want. Drink freely means you can have as much of Jesus as you want. Oh, we hear you coming, Jesus. Oh, we hear you coming, King Jesus. Of the King coming down. I can hear the sound of the King. Just let him minister to you. Let him minister to you. I can hear the sound of the king coming down. Let him strip you of every weight. Let him strip you of every heavy burden that so easily entangles you. Let our ground to the ground. If you have pain in your body right now. Just raise your hand where you are. If you have pain in your body, we're not gonna come down to the front, but if you have pain in your body, just raise your hand where you are. If our prayer team can find anybody that's in pain or if you have an illness but you're not in pain, just raise your hand. I just feel really strongly. The spirit of Christ is in this room and there is a healing touch available. There's some people in the back corner over here we can do this quickly. Just keep your hand up and wave your hand if, if you don't have a prayer partner to come with you right now. And once somebody comes to you, I want you to tell your prayer partner what you need healing for, what you're believing God for so they can pray for you. And then I want you to put your hand where the pain is. Prayer team, let's just release healing. Do what you see the Father do. Say what you see the Father say. Nothing more, nothing less. Don't make it complicated. Don't let human reasoning get in the way. Just release what you see and hear in the Spirit. If you are believing for healing for a terminal illness of a family member or a relative or something, raise your hand. we have any prayer team that can look around. Hallelujah. Wave your hand at us if you still need a prayer partner. I can hear the sound of the king coming down. He's here to heal you. He's here to set the captive free. King Jesus is in the room and he's ready to heal. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, for those of us who are not praying for healing, I just want you to lift your hands all across the room and let's just release our worship and continue to contend for an atmosphere of faith, no doubt. Faith, no doubt. King Jesus, you're in the room. Oh, you're the strong man. You're the healer. You're our deliverer. King Jesus. Could just lead us in something. Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Oh, we lift you on high. Oh, we submit to you. Oh, we yield to you. Shut up, 
to partner with Jesus to do the ministry of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more time, I just want you to prophesy and declare, I'm open. Just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father God, Reveal and expose anything in me today that needs to go. And fill me with your word, your revelation, and your wisdom on how to live like your son and your daughter. I receive and embrace everything that's available to me. It is my inheritance. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody shout amen. 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 Here's what I want you to do. I want you to find somebody in the room that you do not know, and I want you to introduce yourself as you make your way back to your seat, just hug on somebody, release the love of God. We're going to get ready to dive into kingdom finances. But as we do that, just be the love of Jesus to somebody today. Oh my goodness. Anybody else just get too much of the Holy Spirit? Man. Wow. Well, 
Well, it's good to be back. It was good to get away, spend some time with just my wife and I and our boys, and uh, went down to Florida to Islands of Adventure, and then went over to the beach and had a supper for Jesus last Sunday there. And um, it was a rough experience having to look at the ocean and do a devotion. So it was it was rough. It was rough. But no, it's great to be back. And um, tuned in a little bit to last week's message. Pastor Caleb, how many of you guys in, enjoyed Pastor Caleb and his ministry? That's good. I love our team. We have such an amazing team. And um, my wife and I, in a few moments, are going to be speaking into the big announcement that took place this past Wednesday. How many of you guys were able to make it to that? Quite, quite a few of you. Yeah, some of y'all are like, we ain't missing that for the world. We're going to be there. And if you couldn't make it, we're going to explain to you um, what's going on and it's all good. It's turning your neighbor say it's all good. I want to I wanna reassure you as your pastor, even if you think it's bad, I want to tell you it's all good. It is the Lord. And whatever God's in is always good. Whatever God's in is always good. Even if you don't understand it. Whatever the Lord's in, it's always good. Nobody saw it coming, not even apostle, but we'll talk about it in a minute. Um. I want you to go with me to your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. I'm changing this segment of our service from money talk to kingdom finance because really what we're doing every time we gather is we're talking about kingdom finance. And, you know, Jesus actually talked about money quite a bit in his three, three and a half years of ministry um, when he got started at the age of 30. And I want to let you know, God really, he cares. The Bible says he cares about every detail of our lives. How many of you guys are grateful for that? He cares about every detail of our life. And finances are a big part of our lives. It's such a big part that many of you work 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week for money. <laughs> that's, how big, that's how big a part of life money is. And you may not necessarily be working for money, so to speak. You may have a job that you really enjoy, and it's more of a calling. And with that, you get a reward, and that's what my wife and I, that's where we're at. We don't work for money. We fulfill the call of God in our life, and God takes care of us. And that's the same, I'm sure, with many of you to where, yeah, you go, and you, you look at the details of what the job requires and stuff, and you look at the salary package and what all that includes, and you want to make sure you can definitely make ends meet, and that's healthy and that's good. But you got to know you are where God's called you to be. You need to be where God's called you to be. Not where the biggest paycheck is, but where God has called you to be. That's where you need to be. That's the best place for you. If I wasn't pastoring, I would say, Lord, what is it that, what is it I need to get myself to? Do I need to start a company? Do I need to start a business? Do I need to go work for somebody? You lead the way for me. I'm not just going to go put resumes out there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and I'm going to seek the Lord and I'm going to find out where God wants me. Because getting money to you is not the issue for the Lord. There's actually no issue for God, but getting money to you is no issue at all for God. That's no problem for him. He has streets of gold, gate made out of, gates made out of one pearl. Come on, somebody. He's, he's super wealthy. He's super wealthy. He created gold. He created silver. So for us to get squirmy in church about kingdom finance is actually kicking against the very nature of who God is. God himself is wealth. Did you know that God, God didn't just create wealth? God himself is wealth. Now, what I'm not saying is money is God. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. What I'm saying is all wealth came out of God. And our little dollar bill can be ripped up and put in the fire and vanish. I like what a, a very wealthy man calls it. He calls it the government's money. That dollar bill you have is the government's money. And he says God's money is gold and silver. I like that. God's helping me change the way I see money. Because the government just prints money. They just print, 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 print. 
How much debt is America in right now? Trillions? I don't even know. I should have done a little research. I didn't know I was going to talk about this. $13 trillion? Huh? I feel like we're on the prices right right now. What? Go higher, higher, lower, lower, higher, lower. What's $35 trillion? That is insane. That is insane. And we're out here working to get money that really, to be honest with you, that money has no value. People are getting off the uh, U.S. dollar. They're, they're, they're switching their, their backing from the U.S. dollar to different currency. You need to know this, not to scare you. You just need to know what's happening in the world. So for God to want to see you to not be prepared, that's not like the Lord. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible says that God wants to reveal to you your future. He cares about you. And he wants, the Bible says, David writes in Psalms, he's never seen the righteous forsaken. He's never seen the righteous forsaken, nor God's children begging for bread. But I want to tell you, we have a part to play in that. We've got a part to play in that. You have a part to play. And if you don't understand kingdom finance, then you'll be looking for handouts instead of being the one giving the handouts. And God, it's not just about certain people. This is about the children of God, that God, the ecclesia, the body of Christ, he is raising up in this end time harvest, in this end times that we're in. We're living like in the last minutes of the end times. You know, God, God doesn't operate on a time scale. He created time. Time lives within the Lord. That's a whole different concept to ponder. But God himself created time. He caused the sun and the moon, the sun to go up, the sun to go down, all that. He created the whole thing. So you have to understand, God, God's not bound to our, our world, our, our time frame. And at the same time, he cares about every detail of your life. He totally cares about the amount of money you make. He sees everything that you're going through. He he sees all of your bills. He sees all of your desires and dreams. And the key is you just got to make sure whatever desires that are in your heart, they're from the Lord and they're not from the enemy. Let me explain what I mean. Satan took Jesus in the wilderness. When he was in the wilderness, the last bit of the, uh, after the 40 days, Satan shows up. And he begins to tempt Jesus. And one of the temptations was that he took him up on this high place and he showed Jesus the kingdom of the world. And he said, I'll give all this to you if you'll bow down and worship me. Did you know Satan can tempt you with worldly desires that sound like they're from the Lord? Sometimes we get so fixated on certain materialistic things that it's actually not the Lord, it's the devil. And you're so focused on that 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 becomes your God and not Jesus. You know know when something has become an idol in your life because whenever you go into prayer, all you can think about is that thing. You're You're not even worshiping Jesus. You're just asking him to fulfill the desires of your heart. And the desires of our heart become an idol. And what has to happen is, is that Jesus desires greatly that you see him as your exceedingly great reward. That's the desire of the Lord. He wants you to see him that way. So whether I get all my desires met or not, that's okay. You are my reward. And if you go into prayer and you need something, ask him for it, absolutely. But don't let your whole time with the Lord be consumed with what you're in need of. Move into this place of confidence and a relationship with him to where if I have you, I know you're going to take care of me. But with that, the Bible says that God God says my people perish for lack of what? For lack of what? For lack of what? Say it in case the back didn't hear you. The lack of what? The lack of knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Not, Not lack of God's love for you. Many people in the body of Christ are struggling financially, not because God doesn't love them, but because they're lazy Christians. 
They don't get into the Bible themselves and find out what God says about kingdom finance. And those who still struggle with kingdom finance who get in the word, usually what you'll find is they carry a spirit of religion because of how they were raised and how they were taught. And so their perspective on kingdom finance is jaded. And so when people in the church talk about kingdom finance, they have an issue with it. Not because what the people are saying isn't true, but because they were raised wrong. They were taught wrong. And so they filter everything through the lens of religion. Have you ever filtered what God's doing through the lens of religion? Thinking you were right? What was the issue with the Pharisees? They thought they were right and Jesus was wrong. That's the whole thing. They thought they were right. They were walking in spiritual pride. And many believers are poor and struggling and broke, not because they don't love Jesus, but because they think they understand kingdom finance. And their version of kingdom finance is, it's a blessing to be poor. (laughs) Show me that in the Bible. Look at this real quick, and I'm going to have Josh. Where you at, Josh? Josh Shipley, come here, man. I keep looking at this guy over here. You look like Josh Shipley, but you're not Josh Shipley. Josh Shipley's back here. Come here. I think we have two twins in the house. Josh and Esther, you guys come on up here. I want to show you something. Matthew chapter 2, verse 9. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. And you guys come on up. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where their child was. When they saw the star, they were, fi- they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child, talking about Jesus, with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests. Now we're talking about three wise men, also known as three kings. Somebody say three kings. All right? I want you to put this in perspective. Three kings show up. Because they heard about the king arriving on the scene. Three kings show up. And what happens? They opened up their treasure chests. They carried with them on this journey treasure chests. Now that sounds like something you'd hear in some kind of like Pirates of the Caribbean type (laughs) stuff. You know, treasure chests. But we're talking about a different age and time. These kings had treasure chests, and look what was in these treasure chests. They gave Jesus gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They, somebody say they. They opened up their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Jesus was a baby, but they honored him as a king. And they knew their place in the leadership pipeline of the kingdom of heaven. And they realized even though we're a king, we're not the king. We're king with a little K. And king with a big K has just showed up. And what they did was they, when they came to King Jesus, they did not come empty handed, but they brought him a gift. They brought him gifts. Now let me ask you this question. How much gold do you think they brought him? I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not, I'm not going I'm not, I'm not to have you give gold for the offering this morning. Just hang. Unless God tells you to. I'm not, it's not, that's not where I'm headed. I'm not going to like twist your arm here at the end. How much gold do you think they brought? Kings. Three kings. How much gold do you think they brought? How much gold? Just how much gold? Do you, do you think they brought one little coin of gold for the king? You think they would travel all of that way, risk their lives to bring just a little bit of gold? A little bit of frankincense, a little bit of myrrh. It wouldn't surprise me if the amount of gold they brought is what funded his entire ministry. It wouldn't surprise me if what they brought him took care of Joseph and Mary while they, were, while they went into hiding protecting Jesus. Jesus was poor. Jesus was not poor. If you think Jesus was poor... Listen, I highly encourage you to read the word and get a revelation on kingdom finance. Now, from where he came from, (laughs) he came from streets of gold to dirt roads. Two different levels of living. There's no feet washing 
ideally in heaven. There's no, there's no need for it in the sense of the, those are gold. The streets are gold. You understand? God's wanting to remove every limit, every lid off of us on how we understand kingdom finance. And it's not just for certain people in the body of Christ. It don't matter if you're in the debt up to your eyeballs right now. It don't matter if you're broke and all you have in your name is one penny. It's irrelevant. God can take this year and flip it around for you if you let him. I want you to hear this story from Josh and Esther. He came, uh, came up to me a few weeks ago and uh, was sharing with me just what God's done in their finances. And I'm so proud of this couple. Um, God has been removing lids for them. It's really awesome. But they've been working with the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear their story because it's not just, oh, God must love them more than, than, than he loves you. They would tell you they have been through they have been through seasons of intensity, seasons that they would probably say hell on earth, and then they've now they're in a season where the favor of God's on them, but God is helping them remove lids because they're partnering with the Lord and their finances. Share share with them what you're sharing with me. Okay, so I'm going to start with my part and then let her talk about her side of everything. Um, so I was raised in church, so I learned about tithing at a really young age. Uh, but the way I learned about it is that tithe is like God's tax. So like you make your money and you pay God his 10% tax on your, whatever you bring in for yourself. Uh, and over this last year, I, like we came back to Oasis and like we've been trying to live right, but I still had that mindset of this is God's tax every time that I, I go out and I work hard because I'm, I'm a blue collar worker. I, I'm a welder. I go out and I work every single day in the heat and I kill myself to make my money. And this last year, uh, listening to like the money talks and everything like that, it's, I have changed the way that I thought about it. I'm like, God, I can't do anything for myself. Like I don't make my money. This isn't my money. Everything I do, I do for you. So every penny I bring in is yours anyways. So since that change, which actually it happened about October of last year, um, since that change, we, we've been in crazy debt, like way more debt. We were, we were paying out more than what I was bringing in. So we were having to pay, like our bills cost more than what I made, which is not a good place to live. And any financial person will tell you that's not sustainable at all. Um, but because we were paying our tithe, even though it wasn't in the right mindset, God always yeah. met what we needed in that time. But when I changed the way that I looked at everything, the beginning of this year, we have made enough money to pay off all of our credit cards. We... like all of our personal loans to fix our house, which has been a absolute, uh, yeah. So it's, our house is fun. Um, we continue to fix things on it and it continues to want us to spend money on it. Um, They've been digging some underground tunnels, come to find out. Yes. Due to we, some plumbing. So We have tunneled under our house twice. Uh, and then this weekend we decided that instead of digging under our house anymore, we're just gonna run PEX line through the roof and fix our plumbing that way. And then we realized that half of the job was already done. So instead of paying $1,000, I only had to pay 250. So, uh, and then last week when we had the plumbers come out, it was supposed to cost $5,000 and it only cost $2,300. So it was another massive savings that we weren't expecting. So everything we budgeted for, we've been able to pretty much pay out automatically. Um, yeah, so it's just been one thing after another. Uh, and at the beginning of this year, we, I got a bonus from my work, which my work doesn't give bonuses. We, I got a bonus from my work. Like I've worked there, worked for this company for five years. I've had two bonuses in five years before this. And then I got a bonus that was more than both of those other bonuses combined. Um, yeah. And then, but that's. And that's just my side of things. Like, there's everything going on with her. Like, once I changed my mindset, everything started 
easing up on all of us. And then she stepped out in faith and... Well, hang on. Uh, Before you hand the mic to her, because I know that's where you're headed, what would you say... This is off the cuff. We didn't plan to do this as far as me asking this question. What would you say the value of the, the man of the house, the husband of the house, the priest of the house taking the lead and letting God be the one to remove lids off of your mind like you've allowed him to do? What's the value in that? Well, anything without structure is going to fail. So... You look at the kingdom of God, and you've got the Trinity, who is the head, and then that branches down from him. You have your leaders in the church, and then below the leaders of the church, you have the fathers in the household, or the men of the household. So if the man is out of line, then he can't expect anything behind him to be successful at all. So if the man's in line, and then the wife is in line, and then the kids will fall in line, and it all starts from the top down. So with my relationship, uh, I had to fix my relationship with God first, which really happened in October uh, of this past year. Uh, I've, I mean, I've been a Christian. I've believed in God forever. Uh, I've done a lot of really, really stupid things in my life. Um, I have caused more issues in my life than any money problem or anything like that could have ever done. Uh, so once I fixed my relationship with God and started actually doing what I'm supposed to do, uh, it's caused a lot of things in our life to run a lot smoother. That's awesome. Thanks for answering that. Esther, share, share your side of, um, of the story here. Okay. Um, well, so like he was saying, uh, it was a lot of just really what happened in October was whenever Charles Roku. yeah, Roku was out at Relet, we were there. And um, usually I'm the one who's like, hey, I feel like we're supposed to give this much. And he's like, okay, if we're supposed to, then sure. And he looked at me and he goes, we need to give 100. And I was like, um, okay, well, that's cool. We have $105 in our account and we have two bills coming out. So are you sure? Is that right? Like, is that what you're hearing? Let's make sure that we're correct here. And he goes, no, that's what we need to give. So it's like, okay. So I gave that. Um, and the next day there was a check in the mail for the amount of all of the bills that were coming that week. So it was like, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, and then, um, yeah, it's just been, that's kind of where it started. Everything started like, okay, let's, we really do need to step out in faith because we need to get out of this mindset of, well, he's meeting our bills, so that's good enough. Like, we can't go and do anything, so that's, but it's fine. Like, I, I looked at him and was like, I'm tired of being like, this is good enough. Like, no, <laughs> I want to be able to take my kids places and go do things and celebrate stuff and just have fun. And uh, in January, I started doing the child care up here. Uh, once a week and then the first Sunday in February during money talk I sent him a message it's like Holy Spirit is telling me um, I'm supposed to give all of my checks back to the church for the next three months and at that point we were still like every, the bills were being met but that was that was it and so it's like yes like that little bit a week is going to help great it's going to be fantastic and then he goes, okay, now give all of your checks back to the church for the next three months. And it was like, okay. <laughs> um, so he goes, absolutely. Like, if that's what you're hearing, then that's what we're doing. So that's what we've been doing. And the next day I got a message um, because for the past two years, we've been trying to get me on disability. Um, and the judge that we got, we finally had a hearing and everything. The judge that we got, he only approves uh, 20% of the cases that he has. So everybody was like, don't expect for him to approve this because like, it's just the, the odds are not leaning towards you. And it's like, okay. Um, the next day I got an email that it had been approved. Um, and then, uh, and he had even put on there, do not even touch her case for the next 18 months. So, <laughs> um, 
And then a couple of days later is whenever he goes. So I got a bonus, and they also said they weren't doing raises this year, and I got a 5% raise. So we were like, okay, like this is definitely what we need to be doing. And then it went from me working once a week at the church to I was up here three to four days a week. And I was like, okay. And he goes, you still, everything that you get. And I was like, I know. So <laughs> that increased. Um, and it's just been like the plumbing stuff. It ended up being, you know, they were like, it's $5,000. And we were like, I don't know how we're going to pay it. And I was like, I don't know how, but I know that we're going to be able to pay it. And that ended up being $100 less than what we had put back. And so we were able to just pay that. And then with this week, they were telling us originally it was going to be $13,000 to do the repairs that we, in the leak that we had this week. And it was 250 And we're like, we can do that. That's not an issue. That's amazing. <laughs> Somebody give God a hand clap. <laughs> Get it for Josh and Esther. I know it takes some guts to come up here and share your story. So proud of them. Um, yeah, I had no idea she was doing that, giving her checks back to the church. And um, I love, I think one of the main things I want you to hear with that story is not just the provision of the Lord, but the unity in the marriage. And man, I want you to listen to me. You've got to take the lead. You've got to take the lead. And not just take the lead, you've got to take the lead with a humble heart. Not through eyes of religion or how you were raised. You've got to say, Lord, show me, open my eyes to what needs to happen here. Because you're going to be responsible for your family when you stand before the Lord and how you move forward. Amen. And so the man's supposed to be the provider for the family. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says a man who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. That word infidel means non-believer. And so it's not just, I love what Josh said. I mean, he was trying in his own power for so long to make ends meet. And finally he said, Lord, I can't do this. And that's exactly where God wanted Josh the whole time, getting to a place where, Lord, I cannot make this happen. And that's where a lot of men are stuck. They think like they pride themselves on what they can do. Even women can be that way. Don't be that way, because in a moment, God can take that away. There's a uh, parable that uh, may be a story. I'm not sure if it's a parable or a story, but Jesus shares about a, a man who was wealthy, and he ran out of room uh, and as far as for his, his crops. And so he says, I'm going to build bigger barns to hold the rest of my crops or more crops. And he filled that up. And then God says, he called him a fool. He said, you fool, tonight you're going to die. Not that God was going to kill him. I think the point is God's saying, tonight's your time to die. What are you going to do with all this wealth now? And the Bible goes on to say, it's better to have a rich relationship with God than to store up wealth or be wealthy or whatever it is, however that verse is. So the point is this, focusing on your relationship with the Lord and let him bring you in into Revelation on kingdom finance. Amen? Amen? He's got a plan for you. Turn to somebody and say, he's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for you. He's got you. And it's not to stay in debt your whole life. It's not to be the average American and be in debt and use credit cards. Come on. Jesus didn't shed the most sacred thing in all of eternity for us to be in debt on credit cards with government money. It's not how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be the lender and not the borrower. Amen? Amen. Stand to your feet with me. Josh got to a place where he was fed up with where he was. <laughs> I've been there. Has anybody else been there? You get to a place, and until you get to that place, you're just going to keep doing what you've been doing, and you're going to keep getting the same results. And it's not that God doesn't love you, but God's teaching you how to be a king. He's teaching you how to be a warrior. He's teaching you how to be a priest. He's teaching you how to be a leader. He's teaching you how to be a steward. Somebody say steward. Steward, steward is very, being a good steward is very important to the Lord. If you're not a good steward, if you are not a good steward of finances, that is no excuse. He says, if you're faithful in the little, you'll be faithful with more. But if you're not faithful with the little, I can't trust you with more. So you can't expect God to give you more if you're not faithful with the little. Amen? It's the idea of if, if, uh, if I had 100 bucks, I'd give it. Or if I had a million dollars, I would tithe off that. If I had, you know, $100,000, I would tithe, and I would also, I'd go and pay somebody's car off as well. But if you can't simply listen to their story, 105 bucks in their account, two bills coming up, and they let go of that 100 bucks, and the next day, God came through. It's absolutely amazing. 
absolutely amazing. My wife and I, when it came for Encounter Weekend, time for Encounter Weekend, I told her, um, I said, let's get ready to sow this amount for this weekend. And um, before that service that night, that, am, that amount that I told her to get ready to sow, um, somebody sent us the exact amount. Somebody blessed us with that exact amount. The reason why I share that, because the Bible says God gives seed to the sower. So I said, we're going to sow this amount. And God says, oh, you're a sower. Here's the seed for that. Boom. Isn't that amazing? What if you came to church already ready to sow? You already spent time with the Lord over the weekend and said, Lord, what are you going to have me give this weekend? And what if, before church even starts, somebody comes up and gives you the exact amount the Holy Spirit put on your heart to sow? That's happened. Not that exact situation, but that's happened more than once. We said, we're going to buy this minister a suit. And then boom, before we took him to go buy a suit, somebody gave us money, blessed us with, with an offering. And then we took that offering and went and bought this man a suit. It's amazing what God does. He hears your conversations. Yes. Amen. He's a pretty big God. Have you thought about how big he is? He's a pretty big God. He hears everything. He hears our thoughts. He's checking everybody's hearts right now. That's a scary thought, isn't it? He's seeing everybody's hearts. He's seeing who's puckering, who's freaking out, who's sweating. He knows it all. It don't, it don't, it don't intimidate him. Close your eyes, bow your hearts for a moment. Take a deep breath, just relax. Now come give all your gold. No, I'm kidding. Just, just lock in with the Holy Ghost and just say, Holy Spirit, you have a plan. Show me what that plan is. Bring me into revelation of kingdom finance. Whether you're an entrepreneur for your business, whether you're an employee, whether you're in ministry, wherever you're at, Lord, I thank you, you have a plan. And I'm not limited to my salary. I'm limited by you, and you're an unlimited God. So therefore, I'm unlimited. But I need to grow in this. I don't just want head knowledge. I want want heart revelation, conviction on this. Father, I bless your people. You You see the work of their hands. You see what they're doing throughout their week. You see where they are. You see what's happening. And you haven't called us to be beggars. You've called us to be the lender. You haven't called us to be moochers. You've called us to be kings and priests. You haven't called us to look for free handouts. You've called us to be the one who gives the free handouts. You've called us to be the ones that bless people, the ecclesia, the body of Christ. And I think you're raising up many, many wealthy sons and daughters to be able to fund your kingdom on this side of eternity, to bless many people. Lord, I bless your people, and I thank you for their hearts. You know every heart in this room, Lord. You know every situation. Bring them in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you came ready to give, you can give at this time. If you want some time to just ask the Holy Spirit what to have you give, you can do it at the end of service as well. We have uh, some baskets down here if you came with an envelope in hand. Or something physical in hand. There's ways to give on the screen behind me. And uh, there's a giving station on the way back. If you're not ready at this time, that's okay. Babe, you're already coming on up. That's great. You threw me off. I'll look down there and you 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 weren't there anymore. You are one step ahead of me. Um, Hey, man. Hey, thank you so much. You're going to make this moment sound way more spiritual than it needs to. It sounds really good. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Um, well, we just want to take a few moments, and we just want to share with you um, the news. And what we're going to do, just to, I'm going to lead with this. This Wednesday night, we're going to do some Q&A with you and go into more details of what this is going to look like. We're not going to do Q&A today uh, for sake of time and um, and. Um, and so we're going to do that Wednesday. So if you have questions uh, as it relates to the announcement, some of you may not even know what the announcement is, and you may have some questions between now and Wednesday. We're still going to have service. We're still going to go uh, into the presence of God and go after Jesus. But at some point Wednesday night, we're going to do some Q&A, and, um, and so you can come with your questions then. The announcement is this. Um, around a month ago, uh, Apostle Barney was uh, in prayer before Sunday service. And as he's in prayer, there is a, there's a church. It's called, uh, it's called Covenant Ranch, New Life 
Covenant Ranch, is that right? Uh, just about a mile away from here, a mile or two away, down 36. It's 125 acres of land. And he was in prayer, apostle was one morning, and that ranch just came up in his heart. Just, he, was, he, was, he wasn't even praying about it. It just it hit him. He just began to think about it while he's praying. Well, after service that day, he's on a phone call with a lady that attends his church over uh, at the Rollett campus. And she has a dream, long story short, without getting into the details of the dream, she has a dream about that ranch. And, um, and it was that ranch just due to the details of this dream. She, God had her go look actually at the pictures of this ranch. And when I say ranch, what this ranch is, it's a, it is a, um, it's a church, but it also has like this massive horse arena on it. It's like, it's a, it's a big piece of property. And so actually the Holtz used to attend that church however long ago. And, um, some of you guys may have attended there or know about it. And the, the announcement is this, God began to breathe on very quickly of Rollette and Cattle Mills merging to become one church. And that's what we're doing. That's the announcement. We're going to merge Easter Sunday and become one happy family. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. You say, why do you bring up the ranch? What does that have to do with merging? Well, the, what we're looking at, we're looking at getting that place. It's not a done deal. It's just, it's, it's what we're looking at. But what's going to happen is Rawlett is actually going to uh, move out to Cattle Mills. We're going to be merging out here in Cattle Mills. And there's a lot of details to this. Uh, quite a few of you were there. You heard the story Wednesday night. And um, I heard videos were sent out. Was the, was the thing sent out? Yeah. So uh, how many of you guys have, have received those videos if you weren't there? A lot of you? Okay. How many have not received the videos and you'd like to, okay, we have one, just a few, okay, do me a favor, if you've not received those videos, after service, go to our information center, and Pastor Caleb, let's make sure we have somebody back there to help get them those videos, um, because you need to watch it, I don't, I don't have time to go into all that detail, um, but I, I want to, I just want to share a few things, my wife, we want to share a few things, she actually has to leave right after this to go out to uh, the Rowlett campus, they're going to do a Q&A um, after their service, and so she needs to be there for that. Uh, to assist Apostle in that. We're going to do our Q&A this Wednesday as a campus. Um, so some of you may be wondering, what does that mean? What does that look like for um, you guys as our pastors, so my wife and I, and what does that mean for Pastor Caleb and the staff and all that? Um, we'll get into more of those details as far as the staff and stuff this Wednesday, but I want to reassure you, we are still going to be your campus pastors. In this merger, what this is going to look like is whether we whether God has that that ranch for us or not, um, the, the temporary location is going to be here. We're going to be meeting here at this, at this campus. Uh, and what that looks like is Apostle Barney has been also the senior pastor at the Rowlett campus, um, obviously since its conception. And this is going to allow him now to move into an apostolic role. And my wife and I are going to step up and be the campus pastors over this merger. And so we're still going to be your pastors, and we're also going to be able to be Rowlett's pastors, and we're going to be one big happy family. And so you're still going to hear us minister from time to time, uh, preach. You're going to see us a lot during services, all that. So you're still going to hear from us plenty. But I want to explain to you the spiritual dynamic of the value of what's happening here in the spirit. And my wife will dive into this a little bit more in a minute. But what Apostle Barney walks in, it's if you... If you don't understand the spiritual dynamic of this, it may be hard to understand. And I'm not saying that to make anybody uh, feel dumbed down. What, what I'm doing is I, I want to explain this to you because if you're seeing it through a natural lens, you may struggle with this. In the kingdom, there's different levels of anointings. Um, there's different levels of influence. Um, there's different callings. Obviously, you've got apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. Um, and Apostle Barney is a is he, he operates in the office of an apostle. He's a legit apostle. He's not just a pastor. To be honest with you, America has gotten really used to calling everybody pastor. Everybody's a pastor, when really not everybody is a pastor. Uh, we just call people pastor because we feel uncomfortable calling people prophet and apostle. 
Uh, but not everybody's an apostle or a prophet either. But the Bible says that these five, these five offices, Jesus gave them as gifts to the body. What's the gift? The gift is whoever God says, that's an apostle, that's a prophet, that's a pastor, that's a teacher, or that's an evangelist. Joe Oden, many of you guys know him, he's a legit evangelist. That's what he is. That's, that's the office. He's a gift to the body. Um, you got people like Josh Yotter. He is a pastor. He has on his life the office of a pastor. So you've got, you've got different people in the body of Christ that God has, has anointed and ordained as these certain things. Well, Apostle Barney is a legit apostle, but because we're not used to that word, we just like to call him pastor. But he's, he's more than just a pastor, and that's not to be little pastors. So everybody has their purpose. And um, you have legit prophets as well. So that's a whole other message within itself. What this is going to allow, it's going to allow him to move into his apostolic role and what that means is he's going to be able to focus on bigger picture stuff. Right now, over the last 20 years, this August will be 20 years since Oasis was planted out of their house. Um, Oasis Church, not Caddo, but the, but the main campus. And so this will allow him to move into an apostolic role, focus more on big picture things. And he's been involved in the details of the church for 20 years, almost 20 years. And he's... We're, we're at a place as a church where he really needs to focus on more of the bigger picture. Um, he knows how to hear from the Lord, all that stuff, but this is going to free him up to do what he really needs to do to function as an apostle. And my wife and I are going to be the campus pastors over this merger and, um, and not just for the merger, not just for a temporary, just, I'm just saying that as far as as we merge and when the merger is finalized, all that. We're going to be your pastors, so that's not, nothing's going to change. So I don't want anybody to freak out or be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. Usually, people fear the unknown. You ever notice that? What people don't know, they fear. And so oftentimes, what we do is we, we react rather than respond. We react out of fear rather than responding from faith and peace. And so we begin to assume all these negative things. It's interesting how the mind works. We immediately go to the negative. And honestly, when change comes, especially big change like this uh, in a church, Typically people, typically, people move into self-preservation mode, and their first thought is, how is this going to impact me, versus how is this going to impact the kingdom? They immediately think about themselves, not about the bigger picture. And what has to happen is, is you have to think about the bigger picture. And so I am so thrilled, I'm honored to be able to be, not only continue to be your campus pastor, and my wife as well, but also to be Rollette's campus pastor's. And also to be able to be um, underneath Apostle Barney the way that we are, to be able to hold up his hands and be a Joseph to him. Joseph was a phenomenal number two to the, to the leaders that he served throughout his journey. And that's how, that's how my wife and I feel about this. We just want to be the best Josephs we can possibly be to our leaders. And it's important to know that my wife and I, we're called to serve Apostle Barney. And wherever he wants us, that's where we're going to go because that's how kingdom operates. And so God never called us to come here. He called us to serve apostle, and apostle said, I need you to go to Caddo. So it's important to understand the dynamic of the kingdom and how this operates. We're called to him. And where he could say tomorrow, you're going to Zimbabwe. We'd say, yes, sir, we're going to Zimbabwe. And then it would be bittersweet, and we'd say goodbye to you, but we're going to go to Zimbabwe because that's where our assignment is. So in the kingdom, in America kingdom, church culture, it's a little bit different quite a bit different than actually kingdom culture. And in kingdom culture, you get your assignment from the Lord and you fulfill your assignment, whatever that assignment is. And so God is very much a God of order. And so what's going to happen is we're going to be your campus pastors. Pastor Caleb is going to be the executive pastor um, over this merger. He's still going to be on staff. He's going to be with us. And uh, so he's going to be your executive pastor here. You're still going to hear him minister and preach from time to time and all that. And Josh and Kelly are actually stepping up as associate pastors in this merger. And uh, so they're still going to be here with us. Josh tried to run, but I slashed his tires. And uh, I'm kidding. No, they're thrilled about this. And they're going to be working with Jose and Cece at our Raleigh campus. as They're, they're the Pulse directors over there, Jose and Cece. And they're going to be the Pulse directors of this merger. And Josh and Kelly are still going to be, really, we didn't want to give them both the titles of Pulse directors. So they got promoted as associate pastors. And they're going to be... Jose and Cece are very new in Pulse Directing, and so they're going to be working very close together with them. So you're going to be able to hear, if you serve at the church at all, you're going to hear from them still and Jose and Cece. What this means, though, is this. 
In the natural, what this means is this means it's easier for us as a campus to make the move because it's all out here. Whether we go to a ranch or whether we stay here, nothing's really going to change for us. Really, who we need to be praying for is the Raleigh campus because now they're having to drive, you know, an extra 30 minutes or depending on where they live to be a part of this merger. And what this also means is in the natural, it's going to be a bigger shift for them. But for everybody, every campus, these two campuses are having to lose their identity. It's no longer the Caddo campus. It's no longer the Rowlett campus. It's no longer this is my campus and that's your campus. It's we're one family now. Amen. And when you have a family, you got to tell your kids, no, no, you're sharing that. No, that's not your seat. I know you thought that was your seat. You know what I mean? Last time I checked, there was no names, no, no names engraved on the back of anybody's seat here. And if you did it, that was on you, and you're vandalizing the house of God. So I'll let God hold you accountable to that. But I, I want to reassure you, this is actually a beautiful thing. God is 100% in this move. And we're going to go in more detail Wednesday. I'm, I'm very thrilled. My brother asked me, Landon, he said, man, how's that? how are you going to feel about not preaching every week? And I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I love to preach, absolutely. Uh, there's a call in my life to preach. But even more so, there's a call in my life to fulfill my assignment. And my assignment is whatever apostle needs me to do. My assignment is not so much to preach as it is you're here to serve this man. And if, if, if serving this man means you preach, you preach. And if serving this man means you clean a toilet, you clean a toilet. Does that make sense? That's kingdom. It's not about what I prefer to do. It's about what my assignment is. And that's the same for you. It's not just for me. It's for all of us. Whatever your assignment needs to be, that's what you give yourself to. Amen? Amen. Babe, I want you to speak into this for a moment and just share your heart and thoughts on it. Well, you remember at the beginning of the year, we started putting this graphic up here saying basically squeeze in, and I don't know if you've seen it. We had this vision at the beginning of the year that we're going to have to get with our usher team and make sure we don't have any empty seats because we're going to need every seat. Make room for more. And this was, we had no idea that this is how the more was going to come in. And I haven't even thought about this until right now as we're sitting up here, God has already been preparing us in so many little things just like this. I can't even tell you the amount of tiny little preparations and tiny little nudges that adjustments he's already been having us make so that this thing, we're already ahead of the game. It's so funny because the day that this all kind of started being unveiled by the Holy Spirit was February 18th. It was my first Sunday over there as the EP. It was Caleb's first Sunday here as the EP. Y'all remember that day we made all the announcements? And so I got a job that day and lost a job that day. <laughs> so we're all having to make adjustments and we're Everybody. all having to be Everybody. flexible from even ourselves included. And this just goes to show you, you hold on to titles and positions and things very loosely because you never know what Holy Spirit is hey, going to do. I remember, I didn't finish what I was saying about Apostle Barney. He walks in, this is a good time to interject, talking okay. about letting go or whatever. He, he walks just in. Just like this, you know? He walks in an authority and anointing I don't walk in. And she's going to explain this a little bit more here in a minute. The beauty of this right here, we need him out here. The reason why we need him out here is because of the authority and the anointing that he carries. And it's not just going to be a Apostle Barney show, and he'll be the first to tell you that. It's going to still be the body of Christ rising up. This last move of God that's going to come, or at least this third great awakening, is going to be the body of Christ going to work. It's been prophesied it's going to be a nameless and faceless move. So it's not about one man or one woman, and that's still going to be the case. But he carries an authority that neither one of us carry. Even together we don't carry he has wisdom we don't walk in, and the elders are going to be moving out here. We're going to have, I mean, the dynamic, we're going to, Rowlett, it actually has a good age demographic between old and young, but there's going to be a lot more seasoned vets in the ministry that are joining us. It's going to be beautiful, and there's going to be even younger families uh, that join us as well. Uh, and it's not, I say joining us, we're going to be, they're not joining the Caddo campus. It's not like they're coming and being a part of what God's doing here. 
we're having to let go of our identities to become one. So let me, I'm, I got to rephrase how I'm saying that, but go ahead. So if you were here around that same week on Wednesday night, I preached, remember if you were here, I was going to preach on speaking in tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in worship, the Lord started downloading to me this word of we're moving from the Elijah season of just one anointing and one voice, and we're moving into a season of anointings, multiple anointings, multiple streams, multiple different things. Because in the in the Old Testament, Elijah anointed Haziel, Jehu, and Elisha. Do you right, wave your hand at me if you're here that night? You remember Holy Ghost was all over this word. This all came out right after that. <laughs> So when he's saying there's like this spiritual component and that spiritual atmosphere also of what's happening, there's so many reasons why this is happening. But one of the big ones, I believe, is because of the intercession and because of the move of God that is going to hit Hunt County that we have been praying in, this has to happen. It has to happen. It can't just be our voice. It can't just be one man and one woman. It has to be multiple people coming in together, linking arms, working together, releasing our authority, releasing our different streams, and doing this as a body. And we need more manpower. (laughs) We need more strength. I want to share a dream that I had this week because I think this just paints this picture so perfectly. I had a dream, um, uh, like early Tuesday morning in the middle of the night. And in this dream, track with me. I know it can be hard when people are explaining dreams. But in this dream, me and Lindsay and our boys are going on a nature trail. And at the very beginning, as soon as we get to this trail, the Lord allowed me to see it like a map. He gave me a bird's eye view of it. And this trail was like super curvy and like topsy-turvy. It was just wild, and I thought to myself in the dream, I have never seen anything like this before. I have never done anything like this before, which makes me think of what we're doing right now, something we have never seen, we have never done. This is uncharted territory. So I, we start walking on this trail, and at the very beginning of the trail, there were these snakes that attacked us. We, w- we went a few more feet and the snakes didn't kill us. We, we kept going. We went a few more feet, and there was an animal, a small animal in front of us, and it started to attack me. And I started to just go after this animal, you know, like I would do. I would just, defending myself, defending my kids. And I went after it, and then I yelled, Lindsay! And he came and finished the job with this animal. Well, then we go a few more feet, and there's a bigger animal in front, and the exact same scene happens again. I start fighting this animal, and then I yell, Lindsay, and he comes and finishes it. We go a few more feet, and this exact thing happens the whole way through this trail. And I don't know how many animals together that we slaughtered, but a lot of them. (laughs) And we finally get to, like, the finish line, the very end of the trail, And there is this massive bear animal standing in front of me. Huge. It's huge. (laughs) I like that guy did the Trump impression. I can't do it. It's this huge bear. And I looked at this thing, and I just said to myself, there is no way I'm even trying to go after this one by myself. And all that came out of me is I screamed, Dad! And Apostle Barney immediately showed up, and Lindsay, and all three of us just stood in front of this bear together, and then I woke up. And this is the picture. This was the the day before we announced this on Wednesday. And I felt like the Lord was giving us insight to, we have been praying for the glory and the revival and the move of God in Hunt County, and what it's going to take. Lindsay and I have been doing a lot of things, I think on our own out here, but now we're getting to the threshold moment of we're about to actually break through and bust through and the atmosphere is breaking open. These strong men and principalities are under our feet and it requires more laborers for this harvest. It requires greater authority. It requires all of our anointings coming together. That dream does not just represent me and Lindsay and Apostle. It represents 
apostle as the dad, as a father of the house, and all the sons and daughters, which is you and the people at Lakeview, all of us together, linking arms, doing this together. Yes. The the Elijah season is out, and the season of all of your anointings and all of our anointings is going to come in, and we're going to finish the job and see this thing. This is why we all believe so heavily that we need 125 acres because what is going to happen you know the solar eclipse is bringing in like 30,000 people to come for four minutes and look at the sun holy spirit spoke to me yesterday and said this is what exactly what's about to happen thousands and thousands of people are going to come to look at the sun come from all over the nation to hunt county to see the heavens open up so i'm just saying Even though there may be, I think this is why the Holy Spirit bubbled up that verse in me about don't be arguing and worried about if Apollo's your pastor or Peter is your pastor or Paul is your pastor or this is my seat and this is my parking spot and this is, it doesn't matter. Everything is yours. Anything in this house that has been yours is nothing compared to what is yours in the kingdom and right now. So just just be excited. And if you're not there yet and you're struggling with some things, heads up, this week all of our staff is going to be making phone calls to all of our regular attenders. And so you'll have a one-on-one conversation if you answer the phone with our staff this week. You can talk to them. You can process with them. We want to pastor you through this and be there for you through this. And then if you still have questions after that, uh, we'll have Q&A on Wednesday night. But We want to be here for you. We don't want to be heartless and just say, we're doing this. You need to get on board or get over it. We want to pastor you through this, but we're just so excited and we cannot deny the hand of God in it that it's like, come on, don't get left behind in this. God's in it. Amen? Amen. I know you got to go. I love you. Now I have to go. I love you too. I love you guys too. Amen. Hey, Noah, can we move this down there? Is that okay? Can you handle it? It's, uh, can you, I'm going to see if you can do it without dropping anything. Can you do it? How good are you at this? Oh, good job. Good job. I, uh, I want to let you know, too, this was not a one person's decision. This was actually a unanimous elder board decision. And I actually, um, it's been on my heart to want to help Apostle Barney and the Raleigh campus for some time. And, um, and with this shift of Pastor Jody becoming their EP, uh, I think as we mentioned here, she was going to be over there uh, quite a bit, and I was going to be over there from time to time and just be able to help that campus over there as well. And so um, I'm for it. I want you to hear me as your pastor. I'm for it. This is the Lord. I'm 100% confident. Um, there is no reservation in me, and um, we're, going to, we're going to see only God knows how many people impacted by these two campuses coming in together. It's going to be amazing. We were in an elder meeting uh, about a month ago when the Holy Spirit fell in that elder meeting, and it was a unanimous decision across the board for, like, this is the Lord. We're going to merge, and it was a done deal. And to be honest, there was many times that we would bring this up to Apostle about the idea of merging even before this. And he said, no, man, that's not like that. That's not our focus. We're going after 10 campuses, and that's his vision. And that vision still is the same. What's going to happen is we're going to be a stronger unit together to be able to now release and send people out to launch churches, and we're going to be a stronger base and hub. And so uh, to be honest with you, Oasis Church is going to say the same, but as far as Cattle Mills Campus and Lakeview Campus, those are changing. So we're still in the process of getting the mind of the Lord as to what that name needs to be. And so it's going to be Oasis Church something, 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 whatever it is, because both campuses are losing their identity as it relates to that. So when you come together, you're going to have a whole new family to hang with. And you may, you may be asking, okay, so what about, what about the room? You know, like uh, Easter Sunday, obviously we have the tattoo outreach that Saturday, which is going to be amazing. James, how many people are you expecting to be at that tattoo outreach? Probably about 1,000 people is what he's expecting. Okay, so let's, let's keep this in mind. A th- let's, say, let's just say 500 show up. That's still huge. That's still huge. 500 people show up. Let's just say 50 people come to church from that outreach alone. Ideally, 
church growth uh, on Easter Sunday, an average church will usually peak because it's Easter. So we're already going to have families come, ideally, just because it's Easter Sunday. You've got the CEO Christians, Christmas, and Easter only. So you have those, you have those Christians out there. They come to church twice a year. So our attendance is already going to be big um, from just it being Easter. Add to that the tattoo outreach. I'm expecting people to come and get baptized that Sunday. Thirdly, that is the official merger date, Easter Sunday. So now you are just about doubling your congregation with your boosted attendance anyways. We're renting a tent for that Easter Sunday out here. We're going to give the kids the building, and the, us, us adults are going to be out in a tent March 31st. It's going to be a 700-seat tent that we're going to be renting out there. And that's going to be the official launch of the new merger. So as far as that Sunday goes, don't worry about room because we're going to be outside. And if my staff and our key leaders, if we have to stand and be outside the tent to make room for you and others, we're going to do so. So um, it's going to be absolutely amazing. There's going to be exponential growth that takes place. This is going to be a supernatural thing that God does. Not, there's, already, there's already going to be the, nat, the, the obvious growth because you're merging two churches, but with what God's going to do, we're expecting exponential growth with what's going to happen. And I would just encourage you, I'm going to say for you, give it three months. Give it a three-month commitment with this merger. If you're struggling with it, give it three months. You can give it three months. And see what God does and see how the Lord moves and see what happens. It's going to be absolutely amazing. So you're still going to be able to hang with the same people. As long as they're still here and they don't leave, you're going to be able to hang with them. And uh, even if they do leave, hopefully you got their numbers and you can still hang with them. So uh, hopefully that won't change for anybody. But it's going to be an amazing thing. How many of you guys are excited about that? Yeah? Awesome. Awesome, awesome. I, uh, I want to share, um, I'm not really sure which direction to go in, um, to be honest with you. I, uh, I've got two words in my heart, and I'm trying to see how Holy Spirit wants to weave them together. Um, I want you to go with me to, to Mark chapter 4. Um, Mark chapter 4. Yet again, we're going to ask, uh, answer some questions this Wednesday. So if you've got questions, come ready. While you're turning to Mark chapter 4, let me speak into this. This has come up more than once. Um, there's been concern about our church being a large church. And uh, I want you to hear my heart on this as your pastor. I am totally down to be a mega church. Now, before that causes you to cringe, let me tell you why. Ugh, I thought it wasn't about a mega church. It's about a mighty church, 100%. But here's the deal. There's about, I don't know, let's just say 150 people in the room. There's only so many people we can reach together. When you, when you grow larger, a large, healthy church that's in revival, that is experiencing what we're experiencing, we're going to be able to impact hundreds and thousands of people. I want you to understand, one of the things this is going to cause some of you to really have to wrestle with the Holy Ghost on helping bring you in on is getting past small church mentality. I was on the phone the other day with somebody and uh, talking to them about this. And I said, listen, the beautiful thing about a large church is we're able to reach more people. This is about souls. That's what this is about. This is about souls. And so I know, I know typically like, there, there are people out there, they go to smaller churches because they, they like the personal touch. Listen to me. We are going to do our absolute best to keep the small church touch to the best of our ability as we grow. I want you to hear that. It's not like we're going to get too big for our britches. My wife and I are still going to be touchable. Apostle Barney is going to be touchable. Pastor Cindy, the elders, our staff, you're still going to be able to talk to us and see us. I don't want you to, listen, that, that disgusts me. It causes me to cringe. It really does. So like when, when people think they're too good to talk to people. So I, I want you to hear our heart. We're, we're not going to move in that era of celebrity pastors. We're not moving in that era of like we're too good, not just us, but anybody on our staff, our team. We're, we're the ecclesia. We're, we're a part of the ecclesia, I should say. And, man, we're going to build the kingdom of heaven on this side of eternity with, as the Holy Spirit enables us to do so. It's going to be a supernatural thing. I don't know if you experienced, um, if, if you were picking up on what was happening. I know you experienced it because you were here. But if you were picking up what was happening with worship this morning, 
What's amazing, Sarah, when you begin to sing Let It Rain, I literally said out of my, I was on the floor over here, and I literally said Let It Rain, something like that. And as soon as I said that, you said, I see the rain or something. As soon as I said, let, I, I felt the rain of heaven come down in this place. There is an open heaven, and there's, there's an open heaven over this place. There's an open heaven on, over both campuses, and that's just going to expand. It's going to expand. So why, why a bigger church? Because we can, we, can, we can do more damage against the kingdom of hell and for the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. It's actually a very beautiful thing, a very beautiful thing. Out of, out of this, uh, my wife's been calling it the super church. Out of the super church, we're going to raise up so many more ministers, pastors, evangelists, prophets, apostles, teachers. We're going to be raising up so many people, preaching the gospel. It's going to be amazing. Really, Bree's going to do that because she's the OSM director. So Bree's going to be raising up all these people. No, I'm kidding. It's going to be amazing. Come on, somebody. This is a beautiful thing. Very, very beautiful thing. So... Hang in there, buckle your seatbelts, and get your running shoes on. We kind of need them both, don't we? Uh, Mark chapter 4, starting in um, verse 35. I want to talk to you. Um, I want to talk to you about something that's very crucial for this merger, but even more so very crucial for your daily life. Uh, a few weeks ago, before we went out of town, you may remember the message that God had me bring, secure identity creates unity. How many of you guys were here for that? Secure identity creates unity. Holy Spirit had me bring that to get you ready for the merger. Because I know in the natural, people who are serving, what's going to happen with my position, what's going to happen with my role. We had a key leaders meeting yesterday at a Raleigh campus with both campuses and talked about, talked about you know, the potential change that's going to impact some people. Same with our staff. You know, you're, you're merging two staffs together. You're merging two key leadership teams together. There's, there's merging that's happening. And my wife and I right now are behind the scenes working with our staff uh, with what these positions are going to look like and who's going to do what. And so, uh, matter of fact, before we went out of town, we had uh, on one, one day of, of the week, we had meetings from 9 uh, to 4 o'clock. And then the next day, we had meetings from 9 to 12, we had an hour break, and then we had an elders meeting from 1 to whenever that was over. This past week, we had a meeting, uh, an elders meeting that lasted from 10 o'clock to 3.30. So there's a lot of moving parts behind the scenes that's happening right now. There's a lot of intentionality going into. We're not just off the whim, just like, yeah, let's try this and let's do that. We're, we're getting the mind of the Lord to the best of our ability, and we're executing accordingly. And so there's still some unknowns in this process. And with that, so this, this message is something that God's speaking to me personally in my personal life that, that hits every area of my life. And I want to share it with you because moving forward for your personal life and even as the body of Christ um, of Oasis Church, this is how we need to move forward. This is, I really wanted to preach with what God was doing in worship on John the Baptist. I wanted to just get up here and like let it rip. but Because uh, that man done prepared the way of the Lord. And, you know, he says something very powerful, John the Baptist does. He has some people come to him and say, hey, John, there are people that are now following Jesus that used to follow you. How do you feel about this? It's like a reporter. Hey, John, how do you feel about this? Yeah. And, and what does John say? John says, listen, I must what? I must decrease. He must increase. That was his response. I've, I've got a... He celebrated the fact that there was a shift. He celebrated the fact that it was no longer about him. He did his assignment. His assignment was fulfilled, and now the king was on the scene. Isn't that amazing? This is how we have to live. If you're fighting for position, that's, that's not the heart of Jesus. If you're fighting for something, that's not the heart that we should have. In Mark chapter 4, verse 35, the Bible says, as, easy, as, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke up 
woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. What, what, what an amazing story. I would imagine most of us in this room um, have heard this story. Not to single out anybody who hasn't, and that's okay if you haven't. But now you have, so now you're part of the ones who've heard the story. Um, Jesus is with his disciples. Other boats are following, and they find themselves in the middle of a storm. This is not the story where Jesus walks on water and Peter gets out of the boat when the storm happens. This is a different story. It's a different storm, different time, different day. And in this story, they're in a storm. Jesus is actually with them in the boat. It's one thing when Jesus isn't with you in the boat and a storm comes. It's another thing when Jesus is with you in a boat and the storm comes. But this time, Jesus, Jesus was asleep. He was asleep. The Bible says he had his head on a cushion. And the disciples were terrified. They were freaking out. If you remember the description, water began to fill the boat. So it's not that they're just going through some intense waves. Now there's the concern potentially of we're going to drown. We're, we're about to drown. And Jesus is, he's totally knocked out. He's not, listen, he's not waking up. He's not telling, he's not telling the boys to quiet down. He is just, he's, he's out. He's asleep. And there is an intense storm, a radical storm. I want you to, listen, even if you're in peace, I don't know that I could sleep through a storm like that, not because of fear, but just because it keeps waking me up. You know what I mean? Yeah, the moving and the rocking and the shaking and all that. And Jesus, he is out. This, this man is out cold. And the Bible says he has his head where? On a cushion. It's on a pillow. And disciples, they woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? I'm not going to shout, but I want you to hear this. They're shouting at him. Do you not care about us? We're going to drown, Jesus. Do you not care about where we are right now? Do you not care about the situation we're in right now? Do you not see what's going on right now? There's water literally filling the boat. It's about to get your pillow wet, Jesus, and you're knocked out. <laughs> Do you not care at all? I bet you most, if not everybody in this room, has been there. Where you're going through something, and you're like, Jesus, I'm hearing nothing from you right now. I'm getting no revelation, no direction. I have no understanding. I don't know why we're going through this. There's people that are following us, Jesus. Do you not even care about them as well? What's going on right now? Remember, there's boats that went out there with them. And what's happening here is Jesus, he's, he's teaching the disciples something without ever saying anything. This is the beautiful thing about Jesus. Peace, the Bible calls Jesus the prince of what? Say it again, the prince of peace. Just in case somebody in the sambo didn't hear you, the prince of peace. peace. He's the prince of peace. Jesus is the prince of peace. He's the prince of peace. Jesus right here in this story is demonstrating him being the prince of peace. He's modeling this for his disciples. It's exactly what he's doing. He's not threatened. He's not fearful. If you go to, oh, I wish I could remember if it's Psalms or Proverbs, but there's, in the Bible, it talks about how, it says, it talks about wisdom. I think it's Proverbs. But it talks about how wisdom was there when God created the ocean. Well, if you go to the New Testament, the Bible says that God created Jesus to be wisdom itself. Jesus was there when God created the water. 
So for Jesus to be a part of the creation, the very thing he created, <laughs> let me ask you this. Parents, are you, have you ever been afraid of your children? <laughs> I've got a 10-year-old and 7-year-old, right? I can beat them both up with my right arm. <laughs> I don't even need my left. I can take care of them both on my knees with my right arm. I can handle them both. There's, there's no fear there. Unless they, unless they, you know, sucker punch you somewhere and like there's pain. But as far as at the end of the battle, at the end of the battle, I can take care of both of my kids. No, I can take care of both of my kids with just pinching them. Just, just these two little guys right here. There's no fear. My wife and I created those boys. I'm not afraid of them. Jesus created the wind. He created the water. He created the trees that boat was made out of. He created this. So for him to be afraid of a storm and then potentially drowning, he was living in a different realm. He's like, boys, y'all are freaking out. I done created the wind that's causing the waves. and I, I created this. I was there when Abba created all of that. I was a part of the creation with him. We did it together. It was amazing. You should have been there. It was awesome. He wasn't freaking out. Instead, he's asleep. And because he's asleep, the disciples think that they don't care. But he wasn't just asleep. He was in a spiritual state called peace. More than him being asleep in the natural, he was in a spiritual state called peace. More than being asleep in the natural. See, people think rest is often you need to go get some rest. And you definitely need to take care of your body and, and get plenty of rest. But more than him getting rest for his natural body, he was in a state called peace. Everything Jesus did, he did out of peace. Everything he did. Everything Jesus did, he did from a place of peace. You will never see Jesus moved. You will never see him moved by anxiety. You will never see him react because of fear. Jesus never reacted from a place of fear. Matter of fact, he didn't even let death swerve him and provoke him to feel urgent to have to go right when people thought he needed to move. Oftentimes, people's emergencies are their emergency, but that doesn't mean it has to become your emergency. That doesn't mean it shouldn't bother you or you shouldn't care. It doesn't mean you shouldn't pray. But he gets word that his friend is dying, and he shows up four days later after the guy's been dead. Here, there's a fierce storm. The disciples, some of these guys were professional fishermen. They understood the dynamic of a storm in a boat. They got it. Their livelihood was fishing and on boats. That's, that, that, they understood the dynamic. It wasn't like they were noobs at being in a boat on water. You know what I mean? Like they, they understood the dynamic here. And the disciples were freaking out. Peter, professional fisherman. Andrew, professional fisherman. They're freaking out. So in the natural, man, it looks like we're going to be going under. And look at our leader knocked out. He doesn't even care. Being the prince of peace means that Jesus was misunderstood. And God has called us to operate out of peace. And if you are going to model your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if you're truly going to model how he lived, then that means everything you do, you must live from a place of peace. Even when people think you don't care, you 100% care. You just care more about how the Father wants you to respond, and you're not going to react because somebody's freaking out. Amen. Something like this merger, the unknown, what is this going to look like? How is this going to impact me? What's going to happen here? All the questions. You can, you can let anxiety and fear lead you and keep you up and wake you up early and your body's physically drained, and now you open the door for infirmities to come and attack your body because you don't have a strong immune system. You see how all of this works? 
You're an open target for the enemy. Or you can say, Lord, I'm not going to react to fear. I'm not going to let anxiety lead me one more day. I'm not going to let all the what ifs consume the real estate in my mind. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. I'm not going to let that stuff swerve me. But if you're going to live from a place of peace, we all want to live from peace, don't we? Raise your hand if you don't want to live from peace. A little trick question. A little trick question there, huh? Yeah. All of us want to live from a place of peace. But how many people can handle being misunderstood? How many people, how many people are really dealing with fear of man? And because they want man to approve and they want man to think that they're doing the right thing. I'll tell you what, try pastoring a church for a year and a lot will be exposed in you. Because you'll have Sally Joe thinking you should do this. You'll have Bobby Joe thinking you should do that. You'll have Susie over here thinking you should. And if, I'm not calling any Susies out. I'm just saying. You'll have, I'm just using random names. You'll have people thinking, oh, you should do this with the kids and you should do this with the youth. And why haven't you thought about doing this? And why did you choose them to do that? What's going on here? And what about there? And you have to get to a place to where you love your people, but you just don't care. And not caring doesn't mean I don't care about them. It just means I'm not going to allow people's opinions to swerve me out of my place with the Prince of Peace. And Jesus was completely modeling this. That's what he was doing. And the disciples didn't understand it. His own team didn't get it. He was so secure with his identity as the Son of God that when he makes that bold statement, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and this whole crowd leaves him, he was so secure. He turns to his, it'd be like me turning to my staff and saying, hey, you guys want to go too? And I don't think he was meaning it in a demeaning way. I think what he was saying was, listen, you don't make me secure. The 12 following me, talking about Jesus, He's thinking, I don't get my identity from my followers. My identity doesn't come by my followers or my fans. If you're a business owner, your identity doesn't come from your clients. How many clients you have, how much money you make. Married people, your identity doesn't even come from your spouse. Sorry. Your, your identity doesn't come from your spouse. If you're divorced, your identity doesn't come from that divorce. People do not define you unless you allow fear of man to define you. It's really, it's fear of man. It's insecurities. And all along, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and he's saying, hey, look at, look at what I did, and look at the backlash I got from even my own disciples. You don't even care about us. Are you okay with people misunderstanding you? Who do you fear more? Do you fear God more or do you fear man more? If you fear man more, you're always going to be, how do I word this? You're always, people will make up your schedule. People will dictate your schedule if, you're, if you fear man more. If you fear man more, people will dictate your schedule. And guess what? You're going to have a spouse and children at the house that are missing you because you fear man more. You don't want to let man down when you're never even holding man up. As a pastor, I don't hold any of you up. Have you seen my physique? I would be hard-pressed to even be an usher in my own church. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but I'm just making a funny joke. So, <laughs> we got some pretty stout men up in here. That's great. It's awesome. I'll, I'll take you. Secure identity creates unity. 
But here's the thing. You have to make up your mind what spiritual realm you're going to live out of. The realm of fear, the realm of anxiety, the realm of pressure. Or are you going to live out of the realm of peace, the kingdom of heaven? Why is Jesus not doing anything for some of you right now? He's sleeping. He's sleeping intentionally to show you exactly what you should be doing. You know what his disciples should have been doing? They were looking at the natural. You know what they should have been doing? They should have been sleeping with him. They should have been freaking out. They should have been asleep with him. If my leader is not concerned, if Jesus is not concerned about this, I am not going to be concerned about this. If Jesus isn't freaking out over this, I am not going to freak out. And you'll never find time a time where Jesus freaks out. It's one thing to say it. It's a whole other thing to live it. Because when you got people face-to-face with you telling you, why don't you care? Why aren't you crying like everybody else is crying? You should be crying right now. You just lost a loved one. Why, why aren't you crying? Because I'm at complete peace. I'm at complete peace. What, what is there to cry over? They're in a better place now. There's nothing for me to fear. Would well, you not miss them? Of course. Why aren't you crying? I don't know. Poke my eyes. Make me cry. I don't know. I don't know why I'm not crying. I'm just, I'm good. Why aren't you freaking out like everybody else? Because I don't see my king freaking out like everybody else. Oh, you're going to pull the Jesus card? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's who I follow. I don't follow you. I follow him. If he's moved, I'm moved. If you're moved, I may or may not be moved. But if he's moved, I'm moved. That's how we have to live. Does that make sense? Oh, there's times people move Jesus for sure. Absolutely. But he was never pressured to have to give in to people's demands right away. He told one lady, leave. She was a Gentile woman. What was it? Her daughter had a demon? Is that what it was? Yeah, her daughter had a demon. And Jesus tells her, listen, deliverance ain't for you. It's for the Jews. It ain't for the Gentiles. But she says, yeah, but even, even the, uh, the dogs get the crumbs. And Jesus was so blown away by her faith. He told her to leave. Jesus, the one that we think just said, everybody come, everybody, come on, everybody. He said, no, this ain't for you. You need to go. And she put a demand on him. And as a result, from where he was, because of her faith, her daughter was delivered. He never went and laid hands on her daughter. Listen, a lot of what you're wanting Jesus to do for you, has, it really has to deal with your faith. I'm not trying to say like, I'm not trying to be that guy that's like, well, it's your faith that caused such and such to happen. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is if you will lean in. Pastor Kay preached this message on mercy. I heard a little bit of it last week. If you'll lean into the mercy and grace of God and the favor of God and you tie your faith to that, oh, my goodness. Absolutely, you're going to grow. Your faith's going to grow. And it's not that you have to have more faith. You just need to use the faith you have. The disciples said, how do we increase our faith? And he tells this parable at one point in the Bible. It says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Have you guys ever seen a mustard seed? That thing's so tiny. When I was in Israel, I brought a little jar home with me that they were selling so little, these little tiny little seeds, they are so tiny. He said, if you have a faith the size of that, you can do some damage. But you know where most people are in the body of Christ? Maybe not you, but a lot of people are. A lot of people in the body of Christ, they live out of their soul, not out of their spirit. They're, most people in the body of Christ are the 12 disciples in the boat, freaking out. Unexpected bill, freaking out. Bad news, freaking out. Heart skips a beat, freaking out. Stump their toe, freaking out. Most people go to freak out mode. They immediately think of the worst. Immediately think of the worst. Merger, freaking out. The kingdom's growing. Why are we freaking out? Because I just don't know. You don't know what? I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. 
You're freaking out over what you don't know. Nobody, no, nobody, nobody knows has all the answers. We all don't know. I don't know. I just know there's going to be a day where thousands of people are coming. There's going to be people flying in from all parts of the world to come and get a dose of the Holy Ghost and go back. It's been prophesied Oasis is going to have churches in different nations. Different nations. Ain't nothing to freak out over that. Are you kidding me? More people getting saved? You're freaking out over more people getting saved? No, I'm just freaking out because I just don't like change. Well, then that's, that's on you. And I get it. I don't like change either. But you've got two weeks to process this. You've got two weeks. I've had to wrestle with some things. To be honest, as your pastor, I've had to wrestle with some stuff. I have. But God brought me in. He's, he's been helping me through this process. It's been interesting. It's a whole new dynamic. And I'm learning to love it. I'm excited about it. But this message isn't just for the merger. This is for life. This is for when your spouse is freaking out. Whether husband or wife. And you're calm and your spouse says, do you not care about this? Still with our kids. No, I totally care. I'm just not going to freak out. Because I model what my Savior models. He, he did what he saw the Father doing. You know what God was doing that he saw? Sleeping. Does God sleep? No, but you get the point. He saw God at complete rest. Living in peace means you're living in rest. You're living in rest. But you don't know what I'm going through. I don't have to know because there's a peace that surpasses all understanding. People make excuses as to why they're not in peace. You ever notice that? Every demon he cast out, he didn't cast out from fear, he cast out from peace. You can't cast demons out from a place of fear. Can't do it. It's peace. You're just in peace. You're just good. You're just good. No matter what ha- I'm good. God's got me. I'm good. Where anxiety creeps in for many people is when they know they're not doing what they should be doing. I'm not budgeting my money. I'm not tithing. I'm not sowing. I'm not being loving to my spouse. I'm not raising my kids the right way. That's when anxiety begins to creep in. And it's not about works. What it's about, it's about you being so in love with Jesus that the fear of the Lord and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the love of God all drive you to want to do those things. But if, you, if you're obeying the Lord, there's nothing to fret over. There's nothing to fret over. But disobedience opens the door to fear. It opens the door to anxiety. If you're raising your kids right, you should never fear that they're going to go astray. But if you're not raising them right, then there's an open door for fear to come in and tell you they're going to go astray. But yeah, I just see characteristics. Okay. Characteristics are characteristics. That doesn't mean that's who they are. He's called the Prince of Peace. So here's the point. If you want to walk and intimidate the enemy, and you want to walk in power, live in peace. You don't have to come up here strutting your stuff. If you want to walk in authority, you want to walk in power, you want to do damage on this side of eternity, you can talk quiet like this and say, hey, demon, you got to go. And that demon freaks out and goes, Hey, cancer, you can't stay. You got to go. And the cancer says, yes, sir, I got to go. If you're doing what Jesus is having, he only said what he heard the Father say. He only did what he saw the Father doing. How many of us in this room can honestly say that's how we live our life? I speak in tongues and I tithe. That's not what I asked. After you leave church, 
from the time you leave church to the time you come back. How intentional are you about locking eyes with Jesus through your spirit and leaning in and say, how would you handle this? What's my response need to be? And sometimes God will say, don't say anything. And your flesh is like, yeah, but I got to tell him. <laughs> don't say a word to him. Jesus didn't say a word. He was asleep. Sometimes saying nothing freaks the heck out of people. You ever notice that? As a dad, you know, and <laughs> having a very godly father, the scary times are when he doesn't talk. <laughs> oh, snap. He ain't, even, he ain't even raising his voice. That's more intense than him being quiet. It's more intense than him raising his voice. I wish he would throw something at me versus just being quiet. I, would, I wish there would be something going on right now. <laughs> Those awkward moments. How many of you guys love awkward moments? How many of you guys live for awkward moments? Yeah, I've learned to just lean into awkward moments. As a pastor, you have to. You have so many awkward moments with people. Oh, my gosh. So many awkward moments with people pastoring. And just people are, they're trying to grow, and they are growing, and they love the Lord, and they're trying to understand. And some people come with their mind made up, and you can't help them one way or the other. And you just, there's so many moments with people. And you just have to be so secure with who you are. And I have not been the best at it, but you just got to love people for where they are. I had a lady one time come to me, and she had this shofar. She said, would you, would you pray over this shofar and anoint it for me? And I'm like, oh. Lord, help me. So I did not want to do that. But I feel that pull. I'm a feeler. I feel that pull to, like, want to appease her. And I'm like, I do not want to appease this person. That is just. <sighs> Don't get offended by what I'm about to tell you. Because some of you may be thinking, like, thank God I didn't bring my chauffeur to have him pray over it. <laughs> she said, will you pray with this chauffeur? And I, I just, I did not want to. And I just, man. So I said, you know what? I said, you see those drums over there? And she said, yeah. I said, those drums aren't anointed. It's the person playing the drums that are anointed. Those drums, they could be used for the devil. They could be used for God. We could have taken those drums from Metallica last night, and guess what? The same Holy Ghost that came in today would come in today, not because of the drums. She went in prayer with the shofar as if you anoint the shofar. Somehow or another, it's going to be just Holy Ghost going to drop in her house or something. I don't know. I have an anointed shofar. What is that? What is this? My pastor has anointed this shofar. Am I even saying the word right? I am? Okay. I used to call it chauffeur. Shofar. I have this anointed shofar. Hallelujah. And when I blow into the shofar, I tell you what. It's like, ah. So I told her, I said, listen, I'm not going to pray for that. I'm going to pray for you. Awkward moment. And then she wound up leaving our church. So. It happens. I guess you didn't like what I did. That's fine. You just got to learn to lean into awkward moments. You got to learn to be so at peace with you and the Lord. Now, if you're living in sin, secret sin, I hope you are miserable. My prayer for you is just, Lord, make them sick to their stomach until they are completely right with you. Make them miserable. And Holy Spirit... He already does a good job at that. He just, if you're a born-again believer, you cannot live in secret sin and walk in the joy of the Lord. You'd be faking it. You little faker, you'd be faking it. Because secret sin, what that does, and when you're hiding stuff, when you're living in secret sin, when you're, even, even, even if it's a one-time sin that's not secret, if you got the Holy Ghost living in you, you are miserable. Even thoughts. You know, God deals with the big things first, right? I mean, oftentimes, that's how, I, that's how he operates. He deals with the white elephants in the room, and he just deals with that. And then as, as time goes on, now he begins to, like, he's dealing with me on thoughts that it's like, Lord, I don't want that thought. I don't want that desire. I don't want that in me. And it's like there's such a conviction. Where it's like, Lord, for Jesus, cover me with your blood. Forgive me. Get that out of me. Attitudes, 
He deals with this. So this is how, this is how the Holy Spirit operates. So if you've got the Holy Ghost in you, you want him to be, to be bringing conviction. That's what keeps you on the straight and narrow. That's what keeps you locking eyes with Jesus. That's what allows you to pray for somebody with a clear conscience. You're living from a place of peace, not anxiety. He's called the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Let's go to James real quick, and we'll wrap up. Go to the book of James real fast. Somebody say, I got to stop caring. <laughs> Not the person caring. You got to stop caring. <laughs> stop caring. Where's Karen? Who's Karen? Who is she? Not a person. You got to just stop caring. Got to stop caring. Listen, what's the last fruit in Galatians 5? Say it so the back can hear you. What? Self control. Self control is the last fruit. Let me tell you how you exercise the fruit of self control. You exercise the fruit of self control. By living in peace. Not by being a control freak. The fruit of self-control is not being a Jezebel. The fruit of self-control is living in peace. Who can you control? Who's the only person you can control? Yourself. Why do we want to control people? Husbands, why do we want to control our wives? Wives, why do we want to control our husbands? Even at a certain point, you can't, you can't even control your kids anymore. When they're babies, obviously, you have complete and total control over their life. They get to, I remember one of my kids threw such a fit, and they were about three years old, threw the biggest fit at North Park Mall. I about lost my ever-loving mind on that child. Three years old, the biggest temper tantrum I've ever seen him throw in, in, in his life. It was wild. So crazy. I couldn't control him. And he's three. At what point do you lose control over your kids? Three for sure. <laughs> I know that's, that's a for sure thing. I was there. But even then, you can't control as a baby when they poop, pee, when they're hungry. You can't. You, you, from the beginning, you really can't control people. I mean, if, if I could, they, they wouldn't poop or pee ever. You know what I mean? I'm not cleaning that up. You're not going to do that. You can't control it. It's like a perfect child, you know? And when you eat, you just get it yourself. That would be ideal, you know? That would be great. A baby who can just take care of themselves. That would be awesome. But you can't control anybody but you. So why do we try to control others? When we, be, when we step out of the realm of focusing on ourself and trying to control something that's out of our control, we're in error. That's when we just moved out of peace. So like a business deal, you're not sure how it's going to play, play out, and you, don't, you can't control it. So you start trying to call other people to try to figure out, you can't do that. Lord, I give it to you. This is yours. You got children that moved out of the house. I can't. I can't control this. I give it to you. And I'm not going to waste real estate in my mind, and I'm not going to live in the realm of the kingdom of darkness because of something that's out of my control. We've got to grow past this. We've got to be people of peace. When I say people of peace, that doesn't mean you don't have a backbone, you don't stand for righteousness. What I mean is even while standing for righteousness, you're in peace. You don't stand from righteousness from a place of you're shaking because you're fearful of what's going to, no, I'm in peace. And that is wrong. Does that make sense? Look at James real quick. This is really good. Um, and you're asking me right now in your mind, where in James? And uh, when I find out, I'll tell you. First of all, let's go to verse 5, chapter 1. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he'll give it to you. 
he will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty. Somebody say divided loyalty. Is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. What a parallel there between the story we just read and this verse right here. The waves are coming. One moment the disciples are trusting Jesus. The next moment the disciples are not trusting Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that a picture of many lives in the body of Christ? One moment we trust him, the next moment we don't. Do you find, and I, this is a, 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 a question for you to ponder, not to answer right now. Do you find that you trust Jesus more when things are going your way? Do you find that you live in peace when things are going your way? When do you find that you trust Jesus more? And when do you find that you trust Jesus less? When do you live in peace more and when do you live in peace less? Is it when things seem to be going the way you think they should go? God wants to bring you to a place to where no matter if things are going the way you think they should go or not, your peace is steady, Eddie. This is where God's bringing you, to a place to where no matter what happens around you, if it's not within your control, you don't touch it. If it's not within your control, you give it to the Lord. If it's not within your control, you just say, Lord, you're working on me right now, and you're always going to be working on me, and I need your wisdom and your perspective. So when you go to God for wisdom, you say, Lord, I need some wisdom. But he says, do not come, do not come to me and be a double-minded man. Don't come and like one day you ask for wisdom and you're confident and then the next day you question if I even exist. You can't do that because if you do that, the Bible says you have divided loyalty. Divided loyalty. Divided loyalty. He says you cannot expect to receive anything from me if one day you're about me and the next day you're questioning me. If one day you're for me and the next day you're against me. The one day you ask me for something and the next day you're doubting me for the very thing you've asked me for. So Solomon got so much wealth, not because he asked for wealth, but because he leaned into God to say, listen, I treasure the people you've called me to lead. I need wisdom on how to lead these people. And God said, wow, I'm very impressed with what you asked for. Not only am I going to give you wisdom on how to lead this nation of Israel, but I'm going to give you so much wealth. What if the questions you're asking God are not the questions that you should be asking God? What if, what if the key to wealth is not asking God for wealth, but asking God for wisdom on, on how to lead the people that God's put in your influence? Because God cares more about souls than he cares about money. But oftentimes we focus more on money than we do souls. Because most of our focus throughout the week is on us. How does that impact me? What what do they think about me? If I do this, what are they going to think about me? If I say this, what are they going to think about me? And so much of our focus is bent towards me, me, me. And that moves us right out of the realm of peace and into, into the realm of the kingdom of darkness, and we don't even realize it. We begin to operate out of the flesh. We begin to say things out of the flesh. We begin to say things out of an unhealthy soul. We begin to move in a pattern and in a way that's not healthy and it's not right, and we're partnering with the kingdom of darkness at that point. So Jesus has his head on a cushion. He's asleep. The disciples are freaking out. But what is he doing? He's saying, boys, I'm modeling for you what it looks like to be in peace. This is what it looks like. Not one storm ever scared Jesus. He just walked on top of it. Jesus said, whether I'm in the boat or out of the boat, I conquer all storms. That's the point. He wants to bring you into this place. Peace is what brings you into a place where you walk on storms. How do you become a water walker? Not by having this man and woman of God faith. You become a water walker by what? Living in peace. What caused Peter to sink? He took his eyes off Jesus. What does Isaiah say? God will keep those in perfect peace. Those who keep their eyes on him because they trust him. Not those who have all this faith. No, Actually, peace is what builds faith. If you'll stay in faith, I mean, if you'll stay in peace, your faith will grow. How do you stay in peace? You got to keep your eyes locked on them. How do you keep your eyes locked on them? Stop looking at the storm around you. 
Stop looking at what is out of your control. Don't look at what's out of your control. Stop focusing on what's out of your control. Stop. Stop focusing on how you think your spouse should change. Give her or him to the Lord and move on with your life. You're wearing everybody out talking about it. And I, I'm not talking to any one person. Stop talking about your money problems. Get in peace. Stop talking about all the sicknesses that are in your family. Get in peace. Stop partnering with the, the kingdom of darkness. Get in peace. Get the will of the Lord for your life. Get with God. Figure out what needs to happen with you and the Lord. Grow an ear to hear and a heart to want to obey. Amen? So if you need wisdom, ask God, but just don't be double-minded in it. Somebody say, I'm not going to be double-minded. Do not be double-minded. Go to chapter 3 of James, and we're going to close. Worship team, y'all come on up. Verse 13. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, do not cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Are you hearing this? Jealousy and selfishness are not of the Lord. Look what happens. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. When you're jealous and you're selfish, the Bible says those things are demonic. Therefore, we begin to partner with the kingdom of darkness. Moving into jealousy and selfishness opens the door for, for, for demonic attacks. Very, very important. Opens the door for demons. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, listen to this, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Whoa. Where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above, somebody say the wisdom from above, is first of all pure. Everybody say pure. It is also peace-loving. Gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. I want to focus on this. The wisdom from above is pure and is peace loving. Another translation may say peaceable or something along the effect. The wisdom from above always, listen to this. The wisdom from above always brings peace. Always. How do you know if you have wisdom from God or wisdom, counterfeit wisdom that the enemy throws your way? Well, let me ask you this. Are you anxious or are you in peace? Are you one that goes into prayer and you leave more stress coming out? Because if so, you didn't go in and pray. You went in to vent and to throw up and then you gathered all your throw up back up and put it in a bag and you ate it again and you left. God hears, here's everything. And it's all in a puddle. There's all of that right there. See, Lord, what are you going to do about this? God says, hey, I'll take care of it. But we're so full of anxiety and lack of trust in the Lord. What do we do? We just scoop it back up. And we drink it. And then we leave prayer still anxious, steer, still fearful, still terrified, still worried, still not sure. And so, but we walk away and say, man, I got alone with God today. Oh, you did. You sure did get alone with God. Oh, yeah. And you laid it at his feet. And instead of waiting for him to take it and you to walk away from it, you just said, I don't trust you. 
I'm going to carry this. What is anxiety? Probably the number one sign of, I don't trust Jesus. Do you love him? Oh yeah, I just don't trust him. Oh, I love Jesus. Why are you so stressed? Because I don't trust. If we were to be honest, when we say I'm so stressed, what we're saying is, I just don't trust Jesus. I love him. I just don't trust him. That's where many people are. And many people will die and go to heaven loving Jesus, but not trusting him until they get there. I believe you can die being born again, but being immature in your faith. I mean, the man on the cross, he didn't get baptized. He didn't speak in tongues that we know of. He didn't cast any demons out. He probably had a few that needed to be cast out. He's on a cross, and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Nobody baptized him in Jesus' name only, or nobody baptized him in Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He didn't tithe that we know of one time at all to his local church. Matter of fact, he probably didn't even go to church. That jacks with some theology. We have to do all these things to make it to heaven. The man on the cross didn't do anything but put his faith in Jesus, and that's what got him there. Now, you have no excuse unless you're hanging on a cross and you give your life to Jesus while you're on the cross. And nobody in here is hanging on a cross. Unless faith is in the sound booth and I can't see her. God will keep those in perfect peace whose eyes are stayed on him because they trust him. I want you to listen to me. I did a study on that verse last year, the year prior. And what I found out about that verse without, I'd have to refresh myself to get into more details, but the premise of that verse, the premise, Pastor Caleb, that word premise, the premise of that verse. Inside joke. He didn't know what premise meant last night. I said, what's the premise of the movie? He said, I don't even know what that word means. I said, okay. So it's a joke. The premise of that verse, what that means simply is this. God reframes your mind. When you look into this verse, what it's dealing with, it's dealing with the framework of one's mind. You know what's keeping many people bound in fear and anxiety and panic and stress? It's the framework of their mind. It's strongholds that they partner with the enemy with that now what a stronghold is, it's a fortified structure that people can come and go as they please. But in the spiritual context, it's a fortified spiritual structure that we built with the devil and demons can come and go as they please in our mind. That's why Apostle Paul says that we, the weapons we fight with, they're not carnal, but they're for the pulling down of strongholds. They're mighty through God, not by ourselves, mighty through God. Through the, in other words, you can't do this by yourself. You can't pray in tongues hard enough. Tongues is a gift that God, that Holy Spirit gives people. And there's many people who they pray in tongues without faith, if that can make sense. It's like tithing without faith. It's giving without faith. They're just doing it. It's like praying for somebody, Father, heal them, but there's no faith attached to it. They're just doing it. So it's through God for the pulling down of what? Strongholds. What's keeping many people in this room going back and forth from peace to anxiety, peace to anxiety, peace to anxiety, isn't that you don't love the Lord. It's that you've got some strongholds and some reframing of your mind. You're not keeping your eyes locked with Jesus. It's easy when you have an anointed worship team ushering in the presence of the Lord and all you can do is weep and cry and worship and you got believers around you worshiping. And it's like, man, this is like heaven on earth. This is amazing. I love it. I was over here wrecked. You had me wrecked, Sarah. If that was your goal today, good job because you guys did it. Thank you for making me cry. First time I've ever used a hanky while I've been preaching and Josh actually got this for me years ago. You know what it says? Does this smell like chloroform? <laughs> 
It's an inside joke. So it's like, does this smell like, get the joke, and they sniff it and knocks them out. Isn't that funny? Oh, I think it's so funny. It's kind of sick when you think about it, but it is funny. <laughs> I don't know if he started the joke or I did, but it's a joke coming years ago. Oh, so funny. That's my spiritual hanky that I'm using today for tears. No, I, don't, I, won't, I will not blow snot in this unless I have to. I think that's so gross. And then you put it back in your pocket. You're like, listen, we have tissue for that. Wipe your tears and get tissue for snot. Who's going to stay in perfect peace? If Jesus promised it, it's available to us. It's available. But if you don't believe it, you'll never, you'll never maintain it. One of my favorite verses that helped me, last verse, I promise, go to Hebrews, real quick, chapter 11, it's just one book over. I want to show you this. This really helped me because this, the enemy will lie to us and he'll attack us. He'll, he'll lie to us and, you know, people in ministry need just as much encouragement as people they're leading and ministering to. Sometimes even more because of the attacks that come. The enemy knows if he can get pastors and leaders and apostles and prophets to fail and others that it can potentially cause a ripple effect in the body of Christ and cause a church to dissolve and people to get jaded and that's how the enemy wants it. So I, definitely believers get attacked for sure. But even more so, leaders of a church get attacked. And it, that's the beauty of being undercover is when you're undercover. Why, so why does God allow attacks to happen? Well, he allows attacks to happen, not because he doesn't love you. He actually allows attacks to happen because he loves you. You may say, that sounds weird. God's not doing the attack, but he allows attacks to come to teach us how to walk in authority, to teach us how to become kings and priests. If we just had everything handed to us, we'd be spoiled children. So he teaches us how to partner with them. That's what he's doing. So if you're going through something hard right now, if there's no open door in your life and God's allowing this attack to come, you need to figure out what God's trying to show you. Don't whine and don't complain, but figure out what he's wanting to show you. Let me read this verse. It's Hebrews chapter 11. It's verse six. Now I want to put it up on the screen. I want us all to see this. Hebrews 11, verse six. It says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to God must believe that God exists. That verse right there before we finish it, that's, that's the point I want to make. It is impossible to please the Lord It's impossible to please him if you do not go to him and believe that he actually exists. Selah, I just want you to meditate on that. How many times have you gone to the Lord hoping he heard you? Hope and faith are not the same thing. I want you to hear this. Uh, this verse God used this verse to help me so much. This one simple verse to where every time I go now into prayer, I can have the assurance that God hears me because the requirement to even come to him, for me to even be able to go to him, he says, if you wanna come hang out with me in my presence, you have to believe that I'm real. What is one of the number one, one of the main attacks of the enemy? is, is God really real? Is he really hearing you? If he was real or if he was hearing you, why is he allowing you to go through this? It's exactly how the devil operates. He's trying to convince you that either God isn't real or he doesn't love you enough like he loves other people, whatever the lie manipulation is he throws out there. That verse right there, put that back up there. That verse right there is one of my best friends. Anyone who wants to come to me must believe that I exist. And not only do I exist, I want them to know that if they'll sincerely seek me, I will totally bless their face off. But you got to know. So what does that do? Man, that brings such a peace and an assurance to me. 
that seems too simple. It's because it is. As a child, I can go to him and say, Lord, you see what I'm going through. You see the desires of my heart. You see how I feel about this or about that. You see what's happening, and I give it all to you. And Jesus, you're my exceedingly great reward. I'm not going to be moved by people's pressure that they try to put on me or what they think I should be or do or say. I'm going to be moved by you. And everything you do, you do out of peace. You're the Prince of Peace. You're the Prince of Peace. You know what a prince is? Not a coward. Prince of Peace. So you walk in the room and you command authority. Why? Because you're in peace. It's an amazing thing. Why don't you stand to your feet with me? We didn't even get to joy. You got the Prince of Peace. And then you have where the Bible says the joy of the Lord is what? Say it, say it so the back can hear you. The joy of the Lord is what? Our it's our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I got to read one more verse. I know it says the last one, but I got to read this. I'm not meaning to lie at all. I just, I got to read this. Team, put on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Going to verse 23. I want you to see this. I've heard before, and I've dealt with the same thing, the fear of going back to what had you bound before Jesus set you free. If you're to be honest, how many of you guys have dealt with the fear of going back to what had you bound before Jesus set you free. You had, you had that concern. You had that fear that, that, would, that would plague you. Fear in general as well. This, this verse right here, God has used as a, whatever you want to call it, a rock in my life to keep me stable. Now may the God of what? What are we talking about today? Peace. Peace. May the God of peace. Now, let's look at this verse, and I think it's very interesting how God could have put in there, may the God of love, may the God of holiness, may the God of mercy, may the God of grace. He didn't do that. He said, may the God of peace. When you read the word, you got to read the word through the lens of God strategically put that word there for a reason. Not just like, oh, yeah, he's a God of peace and move on with your day. No, he's trying to communicate something. Now, may the God of peace make you holy. In every way. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless. Everybody say holy. Holy. Say blameless. Blameless. Whoa. Until Jesus Christ comes again. Whoa. Until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. What is this now? May the God of who do all this? What does peace do for you and for me? What does peace do for you and for me? It keeps you holy. Living in peace actually causes you to be secure in your Abba Father that he is going to keep you holy and that he's going to keep you blameless until Jesus comes and raptures the church. Oh, I love God. He's so good. Not everybody knows the turmoil that you wrestle with on a day-to-day basis. Your own spouses don't even know the inner turmoil that you wrestle with on a day-to-day basis. Some of you don't have time in your day to share with your closest friends and leaders the things that the enemy attacks your mind with on a day-to-day basis. And what do you go to? You don't go to medicine. You don't go to antidepressants. Go back to that verse. You don't go to Lindsay Huey. You go to the God of peace.
Just leave that up there, Faith. You go to the God of peace. I feel the Holy Spirit. He's wanting to teach us how to operate in a realm of authority from a place of security. Not freaking out. You, you, not just me, you. Where you can walk into any situation and be at complete peace no matter what you see. It can be the worst of the worst and you're at complete peace and you say, give me a minute and you walk away and say, Lord, what do you want me to do about this? And you wait and you hear his voice and you get your command and then you go and you do what you heard the Father tell you to do. You know what many people do in the body of Christ? Let's call it the prayer chain. And they do it from a place of anxiety. Let's call the prayer chain real quick. Call the prayer chain. Call the prayer chain. Go. Did, did, you, did you reach out to the prayer chain? Did, did you reach out to the prayer team? Did, did. That does nothing. Yeah, I'm going to call the prayer chain for you to stop freaking out. That's going to be our first prayer. Second prayer is going to be for what you want us to pray for. Did you call the prayer chain? Bree, can you sit on a mass email to the whole church and have them pray for? No, no, we're actually not because you're doing it from a place of anxiety. Get in peace first, see what God says, and then call me back. See, as a father and as a dad, that's what you teach your kids. Hey, calm down. I love what Bree told her son one day. She said, Hans, does mom look like she's scared? Hans said, no. She said, you shouldn't be scared. If God ain't freaking out, we shouldn't be freaking out. It doesn't matter if it's on a merger. It doesn't matter if you're walking through something personal. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're still struggling with the tattoo outreach. It's irrelevant what it is. If God's not freaking out, you shouldn't be freaking out. Listen, it doesn't matter if you think Oasis Church is demon-possessed. Oh, did you hear Oasis Church demon-possessed, man? I tell you what, demon-possessed over there. That's not peace. That's, that's not peace at all. There's no peace in that. There's no peace. Being in peace means you're in peace. That means your heart rate is good. And initially, you may feel the impacts of some stuff, and you say, nope, I'm going to get in peace. I'm going to get in peace. It doesn't mean you're not going to be tempted. It doesn't mean you won't fail from time to time. You just get back in peace. May the God of peace keep you holy. Will you just lift your hands? I just want to declare this verse over you. Now, may the God of peace make you holy in every way, every way, every way, every way, from the top down, from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, <laughs> not from the bottom of your head to the top of your feet, from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Go to that next verse with your hands lifted, verse 24. God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful. The Bible says God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful faithful. I'm going to give you a different altar appeal today. Oh, I like this one. I've never done this in my entire life. I like this. When you are in peace, I want you to come to the front. I'm not giving an altar call for fear. I'm giving an altar call for when you have entered into that place of peace. You and the Holy Ghost right now. I'm not judging anybody who's not coming down here. I'm just flipping it. Usually altar calls are for if you're struggling, if you need prayer, if you need help. We're here for that for sure. But right now, there's such a presence of the Holy Ghost that's here that he wants to bring you and he wants to teach you how to bring you into a place of peace. Oh, yeah, sing that, Sarah. A sound mind, your spirit is No judgment in the house, no condemnation. A sound mind, a sound mind, a sound mind. 
Come on, let the Holy Spirit bring you to this place of complete and perfect peace. A sound mind, your spirit is here. A sound mind, a sound mind, a sound mind for the spirit of fear. A sound mind so that I can see clearly. A sound mind, your spirit is here. A sound mind, a sound mind. Come on, as she sings this, I want you to lock eyes with Jesus. Holy Spirit, flood this house with your peace. Drive out all fear. Drive out all anxiety. Drive out all depression. No more antidepressants in Jesus' name. No more anxiety medicine in Jesus' name. sense the Holy Spirit resting on you like a dove the Prince of Peace is in the room and he's just resting on you it may make you cry it may make you look relaxed it may cause you to laugh it manifests differently but the Prince of Peace is here And he's telling you right now some very specific things about your life, not to be worried. to ask the Lord to forgive you for being like the 12 in the boat saying do you not care about me and now you realize you cared about me the whole time you were just showing me how to model what you were doing and be in peace open heaven over this house I don't know else how to explain it there's an open heaven just receive, just open up your spirit and receive there's more being done right now in your life than you realize a deposit being made from the kingdom of heaven right now inside of your spirit inside of your soul come on get into that place get into that place of peace and just enjoy it let that peace fill you with the joy of the Lord joy of the Lord is our strength. It's hard to get joy when you're not in peace. Matter of fact, I don't know how it's possible to get joy without peace. Some of y'all need some joy, but you haven't been in peace, and today's your day. You're entering into peace. 
Peace for everything, the Lord says. Peace for everything. Everything. Every situation. Every question. Every circumstance. Everything. Peace for everything. I made the God of peace. How do you make sure you don't go back to your past? You trust the God of peace. And if you trust the God of peace, he moves you into a place of peace. Just enjoy his presence right now. It's about him. Whew. Just lift your hands like you're receiving a gift and just receive the Prince of Peace. Just say, Prince of Peace, I receive you. I receive all of you. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Flood my mind. Drive out all, all anxiety. Drive out anything that's not you. Drive it out. Come on in. I look to you, Prince of Peace. can't have peace and pride you got to got to choose one or the other if you want to move into peace you got to let go of pride you got to let go of control Whew. be a son be a daughter be a child again the lord says i want you to be a child again i want you to be a child be a child be a child trust me trust me trust me trust me since the Lord healing a woman's reproductive system. I don't know who you are, but if that's you, just receive it. of the Lord over you, over 
your marriage. Over your children. I speak the peace of the Lord over your finances, over the work of your hands, over your business, over your ministry. from a place of peace. You can do everything. I see people's spiritual capacities being enlarged. I see your spirit man being enlarged. Self-control is going to increase. That fruit of self-control is going to increase because you're in peace. You're going to begin to say something. The Holy Spirit's going to correct you on it. You're going to close your mouth. God's going to teach you when to say something, how to say something, when to do something, how to do something. It's going to be amazing what God does. He's going to give some of you dreams on specific things, on how to do certain things that people would go to school for. You're just going to have supernatural intel on how to do certain things. They're going to say, how do you know how to do this? Do you go to school for it? No, it's just Holy Spirit showed me. Amazing. This may sound silly, even all the way down to training your animals. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but God cares about all that. Even on how to train your dogs. I think about that because the other night we had people at our house. We had the Lakeview staff over and one of them made the comment, man, so where did you, did you take your dogs to get them trained somewhere? I said, no. (laughs) They were so well behaved. It's like the simple things. The small things. People will notice. People will pay more for your company because of the peace you walk in. They'll They they want to do business with you because of who you are. There's just going to be a supernatural overflow in so many areas of our lives because that we just made it in a point to be in peace. When you want to freak out, but you're in peace. When you want to stress out, but you fight to stay in peace. When everybody else is freaking out. Let me tell you what's going to happen. I believe there's a day coming. I'm not saying this. (laughs) Obviously, to, to... spike fear. I'm saying this because I believe there's a day coming. I'm not the only one. That's, I'm not the first one saying this. I've received prophetic words, heard prophetic words rather that I agree with. And so I, I, I believe what prophets are saying. But a, apostle and I believe, and I've heard this from apostle as well, there's a day coming where the church is going to need to be in a position where we can be a type of Joseph to the community. What's interesting about this story of Joseph in the Old Testament is the priest of the Old Testament were able to keep their land. Everybody else had to sell their land or give up their land to Pharaoh, either sell it or give it to to the government. And I believe the priests speak to the ecclesia, the body of Christ. And when people are willing to sell everything because they just need some food for their families. The body of Christ is going to be there, the ecclesia, to be the lender or not the borrower. They're going to be able to be there to be able to take care of people in times of need. I believe there's a dark day coming where the world's going to be very dark and people are going to need a lot of practical things. Spiritual, yes, but practical. And I believe the body of Christ, you and I and others, are going to be able to be like a type of Joseph in that time where he stored up the grain for what was it, seven years? And then they went through a famine for seven years and he was able to dish out what needed to be dished out. 
Now it takes peace to get ready for something like that. And it takes peace if something like that were to happen. Let's be able to live that out, not freak out. Some of you may feel like you're already in a drought right now. You may be like, man, I need, I need some help now. That's okay. Get in peace. Stay in peace. Watch what God does. Get the mind of the Lord. Get the mind of the Lord for your life. You can hear his voice, I promise you. You can hear, you can hear his voice. But God's getting us ready. And I'm going to be honest with you. I see every one of you as laborers for the harvest that's about to hit. This will not be a one-man show. This will not be a one-hit wonder. This will be a move of God that if Jesus tarries, will go from one generation to the next. It will just continue to be handed off. It's just going to keep rolling. Somebody say it's just going to keep rolling. If we'll stay pure and humble, this thing is going to keep going. It's only the beginning. I've been wondering for the past few years, pastoring this campus, Lord, why aren't you sending us a lot of lost people? Why aren't you sending us the harvest? And when I've leaned into the Holy Spirit and asked him, you know what I've heard him say? I'm sending laborers. I'm sending laborers. And it's like, yeah, but where's the harvest? I'm sending laborers. And some of you feel the same way. Man, we want to reach the lost. I'm with you. But we can't put the cart before the horse. If you only got a handful of laborers, he said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are what? Few. So he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to raise up what? Laborers, not the harvest. In other words, Jesus is saying the harvest isn't the issue. What you need is the infrastructure to facilitate the harvest that's coming. That's what he's doing. So he's teaching us right now. You have to think a different perspective. American church mentality is I go to get fed from my pastor and then I go and live my life and, and my husband and I and our family, we talk about the message and we're in a house fire and we serve and all that. That's wonderful. But we have to start, we have to start shifting our perspective to not only do I come and get fed, of course. You know one of the things I'm really excited about with this merger is Apostle Barney, he's gonna be preaching primarily every Sunday. I'm gonna be able to sit underneath his preaching. I haven't done that in years, it's been so long. I'm excited to sit underneath that anointing. And some of you who are like, maybe like, man, we're gonna miss you. You're gonna hear me plenty, I promise. Maybe even sometimes too much. But he walks in revelation and anointing that I do not walk in, and it will bless you and benefit you. Oh my goodness, beyond your wildest dreams. It will be amazing. But we have to shift our perspective from us four, no more me and my family and us getting fed, to when I show up, yes, I'm going to receive, but I'm a laborer, I'm going to give. You're, if you're born again, you're, in a la- you're a laborer. If you're born again, you're a laborer. So let me ask this question. Who's a laborer in the room? If you're a born again believer, you're a laborer. You may not see yourself as a laborer, but if you're born again, you know what God says? You're a laborer. Raise your hand again. Come on. Look at all the laborers in the room. Guess who's going to be loving on the harvest of souls that come in? Woo! Oh, yeah. Welcome to being on a church labor team. This, that's all it is. I think we've made this culture in our mind of like the pastor and the staff and key leaders and people who serve, they kind of do it all. No, man, we're all laborers. We're all laborers. So at this tattoo outreach we're doing, guess who's the laborers for that? Oh, like a third of you have your hand up and the and like the rest of you had I thought you were laborers. Who's who's gonna be laborers at this tattoo outreach? You're a laborer. You see what I'm saying? Well, I'm not a part of the outreach ministry. Says who? You are if you're a laborer, you're a part of the outreach ministry, you're a part of the healing ministry. Come on now. Because people are gonna come in and you're gonna be in the lobby. Can I pray for you? You're a part of the hospitality ministry, making people feel loved and welcomed. You're a part of the greeting ministry. As people come in, the door greeters are gonna be there, but guess who they're gonna run into? You, you're gonna say hello, or are you gonna be a jerk and not greet them because you're not on the greeting team? I'm not on the greeting team today, so I don't greet anybody. You're a laborer. I'm not on the prayer team today, so I don't pray for anybody who's sick. That's not biblical. And the altars, that's different. And the lobby, man, you pray, you, you understand. 
there's like inner healing and deep things happening down here that we want you trained and equipped. We want to know you. The Bible says, know those that you labor among. You got to be a good singer to be on the worship team. I'm sorry. If you're a bad singer, we're not allowing you to sing. But I have a passion for it. Okay, sing in the shower. You're not going to be up here. I want to play guitar, but if you can't play, you're, and if you don't know the, uh, a beat on drums, you're not being a drummer. It just doesn't matter how bad you want to. This makes sense. You're a laborer. You, you can pray for people that are sick. There's going to be so many people coming in. We're going to have to say, hey, stop praying for them. Come to church. Come on in. Come on. Church is getting going. It's going to be awesome. And we, we got so much in our heart from... I have a vision to see us have a, uh, a school, K through 12. So it's an alternative. If you don't want your kids in public school, you can come and bring them to a Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled school. Absolutely. There's so many things that's in our heart, in there, Crystal. We, we have it in our heart to have a dream center, getting people off drugs and prostitution and homeless and all that and bring them in and help them get on their own two feet. I got a prophetic word from Tim Gidley a few years ago. I mean, just totally read my mail on that. Guess who's gonna be doing that though? You are, not me. I'm just gonna be helping lead it. God sent us crystal Kent and Manny and others, people, you bleed this, Jennifer, and others, you bleed this type of ministry. We're going to host it. We're going to have all kinds of things. It's going to be amazing. I do want to say for this tattoo outreach that's coming up, talking with Apostle about it, and I totally agree with him. He wants nobody from the church getting tattoos that day. And the reason why is because it's for the community. It's not for us. So you may have thought, man, I want a free tattoo. If there's like a, a slump in the day, totally, you can get one. But as long as people are coming, we ask that no, no church folk get a tattoo. All right? Because I love tattoos. I'm not going to get one. So we ask that you, when you show up, well, it's going to be from 10 to 7 o'clock. So um, we're going to have teams that rotate, I think, every three hours. And we're going to do a training on that too leading up to that event. So I just... I have a vision to see everybody a part of this house be at that event. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I have enough faith to believe everybody can get beyond the idea of a tattoo happening within a metal building that honestly, we may sell this property and somebody may buy it and turn it into a warehouse. So it doesn't matter. This is a metal building. So point is, is I have enough faith for everybody to be here throughout that day, rotate times, whatever. We're gonna have bounce houses for kids. We're gonna have food throughout the day. It's gonna be an amazing event. It's gonna be huge. And what's gonna happen, we're just gonna love on people. So we're not gonna like get in line and like get tattoos and love on, we're just gonna love on people. And so some may get saved there, but we're gonna do a training for this. And that way we're all on the same page, but it's gonna be amazing. If we have a thousand people show up that Saturday from 10 to seven o'clock, you know how many people will walk away not realizing what hit them. So many people. This event has never been done in this region, ever. This is like a, and I love Apostle's, Apostle Barney's heart. He prayed this prayer that it really moved me. He said, Lord, if we lose our reputation, that's okay. You know what many people freak out over with stuff like this? Reputation. What do people think? Really what they're saying is, I really care too much about what religious people think. But if it's for one soul, it's worth it. Amen? So our baptismal service that Sunday, depending on how many people get baptized, it may be a crazy baptismal service. I think we're looking at doing like multiple troughs, just dunking people. It won't be like, we won't have time to say, tell us your name, why are you doing this? What we normally do, it's gonna be like, just dunk, all right, next, dunk, boom. It's gonna be awesome. And that will happen on a regular, I promise. As, as God continues to breathe on this merger and what's happening, there'll be so many people coming in. It will probably look like, it'll probably look like during worship or something, the team's just worshiping and on the screen, people are just getting dunked and we're worshiping and we're crying. You're like, get it. <laughs> are you ready for that though? Who's, isn't that awesome? 
Isn't that amazing? So are you okay with giving up your seat for somebody who needs it? <laughs> All right, we have this live stream. I'm going to hold you to it. We're going to dissect everybody's voice who said yes. Roy said yes. Ginger said yes. Amanda said yes. Everybody. No, really, because as people come in right now, what we're working with is we're working with um, outside of that Easter Sunday, we're going to be in here. And we can fit quite a few people in here. Uh, one option is, depending on how long we're here, because we have to wait for property to sell, we're going to be selling our Rolette property. And so, but starting Easter Sunday, the merger is, a, is, a, the merger is official. That Easter Sunday, so every Sunday now, Lakeview and Rowlett, we're one. We're just Oasis Church. Now, for a while, you may say, are you from Rowlett? Are you from Caddo? And you may have to get to know people, but outside of that, we're one. And I would highly encourage you to do this. As people come in, if we don't have enough seats, since they're making the drive out here, can we give up our seats for them? If anybody's going to stand, now I get, I get we have... I get we have people who they, they need a seat. I totally get that. They're, they're like, we have elderly people and stuff. If you need a seat, I get that completely. So that's different. But if you're able to stand, what if we just helped with this merger and just making this thing so smooth by taking the lead in that regard and just say, come on in. Come on. Get my seat. Amen. That'd be beautiful. It'd be so awesome. We're going to love on them. They're going to love on us. You're going to get to know some new people. You're going to be blessed. I have no idea what this is all going to look like, but it's going to be awesome. I mean, today, just, there was rain falling from heaven in here. I couldn't stop crying. Y'all were insane. It was just amazing. My goodness. I think it's because you're on the worship team now. I really think that's what it boils down to. Lisa joined the team and the rain came. Hallelujah. There it is. There it is. Uh, hold hands with somebody next to you before we go. I love the unity that's in the house. Secure identity creates unity. Pastor Caleb, come up here. Hallelujah. I'm going to make it to where your hands are sweaty so you actually lock in some DNA with one another. <laughs> See how unified we can be. You're a spirit being. You're, you're not a fleshly being, so it's okay. I want you just to pray over this campus. It's, it's exciting for me of this merger but I'm, I'm going to be taking in these next few services it's been a fun fun ride to be your pastor for 10 years and that won't change we're just going to keep growing But just know I'm going to be taking these moments in. And even though we're adding to the family, it's like you, before you adopt or you go on your baby moon before you have a kid, like you just take those last few moments in. It's sweet, sweet. It's not bittersweet. It's sweet, sweet. I just want you to know, me personally, if I cry, you're going to have to excuse me. It's been very special. Just pray what's in your spirit. Father, right now, I just declare family. <laughs> over this body, a oneness like never before. A uniting of spirit, soul, and body right now as we join hand in hand. Lord, I thank you for Ephesians as Apostle Paul prayed that we would be bound together with strong ties of love for one another. <laughs> I just declare that strong ties of love being bound together between us as a body. Lord, I thank you this merge is going to be smooth. It's going to be fluent. Lord, you're merging two bodies together, two campuses to one. And God, as we merge together, I thank you that it's going to ripple effect in this region and there's going to be a merging of those that are far from you. They're going to become one with you, Jesus. I just thank you that this is a holy interruption that's going to bring about an eruption of the glory of God. And we declare that Hunt County shall know the Lord. 
that Hunt County will come to know Jesus. And we thank you for that, and we declare that done in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. 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 Give God a hand clap of praise. Well, hey, you can make your way back to your seat. You can hug somebody on your way. Tell them you love them. Our value this month is honesty. And I want to encourage you, when you walk in the gift of honesty, you're walking the way that Jesus walked. And you're, uh, you're walking in the ways of heaven. Amen? Hey, don't forget this Wednesday. Everybody say this Wednesday. This Wednesday, we're going to have our annual victory report for our Cattle Mills Campus. What better way to end one season than to see all that God did through this campus at Cattle Mills? So after our service on Wednesday, we're going to do that. It's going to be awesome. We love you. Until next time, be an oasis wherever you go.